thanks for coming on. Thanks for chatting. Let's let's talk about. Well, the reason I wanted to talk to you in the first place is partially just because I feel like you have a pretty interesting life, and I have wanted to catch up with you in a for a while. Uh, it, the version of your life in my head, anyways, is like, whoa. Tyler is this guy that I had some good conversations with when I was little and I never actually got to finish any of them because oh, it was wow. like, okay, <laughs> well, well, let's do it. Let's, uh, let's, let's finish the conversations great. that intrigued me so much as a 14 year old. Wow. That's, that's great, man. I, I, well, I, cause you said you're turning 26 and I'm 33. So, so it's like 10 years or more than 10 years. Uh, we, we, no, what I mean is, uh, like you're 25 right now, mm -hmm. right? So we're what eight years apart? Yeah. And uh, so if you were fourteen, I would have been in my twenties. Yeah. You were and I'm probably trying to think of yeah. Just Sorry? just early angsty twenties, probably. Because I remember specifically we were having some I think we were talking about evolution or something, which was kind of like oh. a bit of a bit of an edgy topic to talk about in Christian circles at that time. Right. Yeah, well, it definitely depends on the Christian circle you're in, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And w the way I grew up, that was like, evolution was like, don't go there. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but, uh, okay. Yeah, now I can place it. Yeah, I was, anyway. Well, yeah, so, like, I, I, what I took away from that conversation, I remember you, you kind of sat me down, and you're like, Garrett, this is not me telling you what to believe, but I just want to, I, I think you said something like, it's okay to ask questions. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was like, oh, wow. I guess maybe, I don't know. Like, go, being, I mean, I grew up with my family wow, traveling I around. I sat you down. I'm uh, like, I, I hope I didn't traumatize you. No, like, I, I remember sitting on your bed because that was, or no, maybe it was Eric's bed. Okay. <laughs> and you yeah, were for, like. For any listeners, this wasn't some creepy thing. Okay? Like, <laughs> it, 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 this... <laughs> but then, then years later, I hear. I hear my, my parents like concernedly talking about, oh, Tyler, yeah, he's, he's joined the, the Catholic Church. Oh, okay. So, I, wait, I, I hadn't joined the Catholic Church at 22, though. No, no, not at that point. But that no. was kind of the last image I had of you in my head, and I was like... Or well, as I said, it's okay to ask questions, and then the last you heard of me was like, he asked so many questions, he became Catholic. Oh. <laughs> Is that sort of like... That, I, that's I, maybe you know the, the narrative, yeah, that hours. I have in my head is like, okay, how, how did you get there? And I, it's like, I, I'm at a place where like, I, I don't, wouldn't, I don't know how strictly I would identify with any particular denomination. I mean, I guess right. I, I would probably say that I'm evangelical because that's, that's my background, but yeah, yeah. I'm not like, well, that, this is even, even something I want to ask you about is like yeah. when you, so first I want to know about how how you got there but when you think okay. about denominations and being part of this great you know church catholic <laughs> to yeah, use it yeah. as more of a technical word um do you feel like the other denominations are getting this wrong and like you kind of wish everybody would would get to where you're at or is it like like when i think about being an evangelical it's like right. i don't even ne necessarily think it's the best denomination it's just that's where I am. That's the history of, of what I've learned and what I've been brought up in. And that's my community. So, and we're part of yeah. something bigger. See, and that, I think that's where a lot of, a lot of evangelicals are at. Uh, I can't I mean, I can't speak for everyone, but when I grew up Christian, I, I sort of grew up with, it's normal to have denominations. Yeah. Right. Like that's just a given. Of course there's different flavors and a lot of the differences are probably very trivial, trivial or peripheral, or they have orange carpet, or they're a little bit more charismatic. You know what I mean? So I kind of had just a childlike understanding of, oh yeah, it must have always been that way. Uh, and my upbringing also was like I was homeschooled with like Bible Belt, like Pensacola, Florida, Bob Jones, Becca Books. Yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not knocking it. Like there was a, a lot of good things in there, but uh, it's definitely on the like fundamentalist side. So yeah, I would say it's, um, well, I was definitely not raised pro Catholic. I'll, I'll put it that way. <laughs> uh, I, I think I was, I grew up with an, an, an anti-Catholic bias, although I wasn't like picketing anything or, you know, like some people are super extreme. Right. But, uh, I, that was my upbringing and, yeah, I mean, I saw God at work in my life and I would read the Bible and like there was all sorts of great things that I learned and that I saw were true. Uh, but when you reach a certain age, like you can't have the same type of um, faith, like your faith has to mature, it has to grow. 
Yeah. Right. Like you have the same faith that you had when you were seven as a 30 year old, something's kind of wrong. And I'm not speaking against what Jesus said about having a childlike faith. That's not what he meant by that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. Yes. You have a childlike trust in God because I mean, compared I, to God, I, yeah, you're always going to be like a toddler. I noticed that narrative kind of like just looking at almost everybody who's at a similar age. I mean, similar age to where I'm at is just like, I see everybody even posting things on their Facebook about like, I finally get it, but they're right. all getting it in a, in a, oftentimes in a totally different way. And it's like, Oh, now I finally understand how to read the Bible. Now it, it makes sense. And now I realize that actually all along I should have been a Mormon. Oh boy. <laughs> I don't know how they came to that conclusion, but, uh, I'd be interested in seeing that. <laughs> um, well, so do you want me just to kind of keep like, what yeah, specifically well, so, so do, do you want me try to, to I, I mean, mean it's, it's a huge, like there are many layers to it and I'll try to keep it simple. What was the, th the thread? Maybe you can point to a particular moment or a particular sure. question that like you started to pull and be like, okay, I need to figure this out again. This is not making sense to me. Okay. Well, I'll start probably around 17. I just had my own questions in general, just of, like, let's use the mere Christianity terminology from C.S. Lewis, right? So not even thinking denominationally, just like basic Christian questions that I think any Christian of any stripe would ask. One sure. being like, does God even really exist? Is this whole Christian thing right. even like, or did I just grow up with it and accept it? And maybe it's not even real. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> So now, and at that time, Chris, uh, like Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins were huge. Like the, that new atheist movement was really, really yeah, like yeah. trending and popular. And so, um, I was seeing some of these videos on YouTube and they were asking questions that like, I had never really heard before, never really thought of before. But I think what was good is I didn't just be like, I wasn't just like, um, oh, Wow. What great questions. I don't have the answer for that. Christianity must be false. And so now I get to do what I want to do. Yeah. I was like, okay, here's some questions. Let's find some smart Christians who know more than me that maybe have responses to them. So like there was the, the, um, God delusion by Richard Dawkins, but yeah. there was also the, um, I think it was called the Dawkins delusion or something like that. Or there was all sorts of responses yeah, yeah, yeah. by, by, other there was this fiery back and forth for a while. Yeah. Uh, or uh, like William Lane Craig. When I found William oh, Lane yeah. Craig, he was, uh, he was a real eye opener for me. I'd never heard Christian philosophy before ever in my life. Right. Uh, the, the only Christian philosophy that I got was mere Christianity. When I read that book, that like was really pivotal for me. But you know what? Before I get into like any philosophy or natural theology or anything like that, what I would say that's really important too is um, around 17, I also just began seeking God in like a more sincere way where I was going away from like what my parents had taught me. And so like, I'm sort of mimicking what I've always seen. It was more like, you know what, God, like if you're really out there, I want to seek you anew and kind of like discover you for myself. You know what I mean? So it's like, I don't want to just rely on my parents' faith anymore. I, if you are true, then I'm going to be hundred percent. If it's not true, then I'm not even going to bother. Right. So like that was sort of like this and, was and you describe that as being like a more sincere way of of trying to figure out your religion. Like they, is that? Yeah, it, it was like, look, if this is real, if Jesus is God and He rose again from the dead, and there's really a heaven and a hell, like that stuff matters. I was, but right. I was like, if it's not real, what a waste of time. Right. Do you know what I mean? Like, if that's not real, why would I? Why would I why would go to bother? church and like pray and stuff? Like. But if it's real, then I better do it because like my soul's on the line. Right. But not only that, I'd be missing out on like my life's purpose and a loving relationship with my creator. Like, yeah. so it's, it's like, you're either missing out on the best thing in the world or you're like, like St. Paul says, like to be pitied the most because you're just, like wasting your time. Like you're, you're basing well, your whole see, life around. I, the I, I even kind of like when I think about that, I, I wonder like I, I would like to even be able to argue for the utility of religion, even even if it wasn't right. <laughs> oh, like, because right. I, well, I, I see, don't I know guess if I'd be sort of a like I, I like the truth. <laughs> like I I just want to do what's real. Like it's true. Yeah, there. Okay, I, I know what you're saying, but like I think 
the kind of questions you're talking about is like you want to know what's actually real. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you that's that, that's definitely the the driving force behind you know where the questions I've been asking for the past while too. See, and that's good, and God's placed that in our hearts. You know what I mean? Like we ought, like we have a mind, like you have a belly that desires, like you get hungry. Yeah, and yeah. There the, is such the thing Lewis as thing. food. Yeah. So you desire truth. Your mind desires truth. There is such thing as truth. You know what right. I mean? So, I mean, you've probably heard that before. That's probably pretty. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that's the mere I, Christianity thing, right? Yeah. Well, he's going back to like St. Thomas Aquinas. I d- to, it's been a while since I read it. Does he actually like go into it for a while? He's like, okay, here's what, what Thomas Aquinas had to say. Um, you know what? I would, I don't know if he quotes, uh, I'm pretty sure that C.S. Lewis would be familiar with St. Oh, Thomas probably, Aquinas. Probably, yeah. Um, and I'm sure St. Thomas Aquinas, well, he's also going back to Aristotle. So like everyone's getting it from somebody else. Aristotle goes back to Plato and you know what I mean? Like, yeah. but, but there's many people that ask these huge questions and, um, you know, they, they realize these basic things of like, okay, I just, and you're right. C.S. Lewis does make this argument as well, as well as many other that like, I have a desire for food. There is such thing. Like I have thirst. There is such thing as water. I crave friendship and love. There is such thing as that. Right. If I, uh, and again, I'm not like, I'm not a philosopher, so I'm not like properly technically saying it, but I'm just saying it in a simple way um, that we have a desire for there must be more that there's something transcendent. Yeah. You know, well, where does that come from? Like, yeah. why would we have this deep longing desire for something that doesn't exist? Like it just, yeah. You know? So uh, h- how did you find like, so, so that that's a good starting place, but I mean, obviously I'm not a Catholic. So how, how, what, what was right. different about your journey that, that like land, something landed there for you? Yeah. Okay. Well, first I started questioning, religion itself, mainly Christianity, but I was like, maybe Christianity's wrong. Maybe like other religions have it right. You yeah. know what I mean? What I did know is they can't all be right. Yeah. Like you can't have contradictory statements and they all be true. Right. Either we're all wrong, you know, and nobody knows, uh, or you, you know what I mean? Like that, that kind of thing. Yeah, but, so I, and mean, I was I, trying to find like basic principles that I could stand on. I was trying yeah. to get this organized in my mind. Sure. It's like, okay, let, let's deal with like, is God real or not? Let's look at arguments for that. William Lane Craig just like really <laughs> hit the ball out of the park on that one. Yeah. And then I found other people since him um, and, and finding like arguments for God was helpful intellectually. But what I would say is intellect is not enough, right? Like it, the intellect's important, but your heart also has to follow. I think God... Uh, you know, first got me with my intellect, uh, and then and then it takes a while to get to your heart. Mm-hmm. So I was asking questions within my own denomination and within Christianity in general, and, and but I was also seeking God too in prayer. Like I would wake up early in the morning and kind of go on a walk and be like, God, can you just like reveal yourself to me, or like you know, I don't know, like show up in the sky or something. Like that'd be sweet. And uh, that didn't happen. But, um, so was that discouraging? <laughs> uh, well, I, I get, I guess, uh, you, you know what? I think God, I didn't even realize it. Like God was giving me a grace to seek him anyway. So I wasn't discouraged by that. Like, and what I did, I was reading in the book of James. Cause what I had been taught is like, read the Bible. Like God speaks through the Bible. Right. right. Which is true. Okay. I still believe that as a Catholic that, you know, whatever is true in Protestantism is true in Catholicism. Do you know what I mean? It's not like. Yeah. Well, what I was going to say, it's a second ago, you were saying like, you know, you can't have all the religions can't be right because you can't have mutually exclusive statements that are, that are. Yeah. But I mean, the way I I would kind of then parse that is just that, okay, so probably all of the religions are wrong to varying degrees. (laughs) Right. So, so yeah, see, and that, that's where it's more nuanced is it's like, oh, well, that would be a whole other issue. So, <laughs> so I'm going to try to keep it on uh sorry. Wow. This is so, kind of scattered. Cause it's so, it's so massive, right? Yeah, it's, it's like, a big how, question. Man, how do I tell you my life since 17 and everything going on? Like, <laughs> oh boy. Oh boy. So, uh, oh boy. Yeah. You'll want to edit out my oh boys and my uh, pregnant pauses here. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was asking questions and I read in James where, Uh, It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, and I was like, oh, that's me. Uh, You should ask God for it, and he'll give it to you. 
And I was like, oh, sweet. That sounds great. And he said, but make sure like you actually, you know, believe that. Because if you're doubting, it's like a guy who looks in the mirror and when he leaves, he immediately forgets what he looks like. And that really just jumped out to me. So I was like, okay, you know, I, I prayed, God, please give me wisdom. And I'm not going to say it happened right at that moment. And again, I don't want people to be discouraged and think like, oh, Tyler said this prayer and then this magical thing happened. Why hasn't that happened to me? Why is God like, we're all in different stages and what God is doing in your life or someone else's life. Like he knows what you need when you need it. So uh, at least for me, when I prayed that prayer, I can't tell you exactly when after that, something did change in me where I had a desire to read. And before that, I really hated reading. And I know you might say, well, what, then why were you reading James? And it's like, well, I can read a couple verses a day because I was brought up to like, you should read your Bible every day. And so it's like, sure, okay. Yeah. So I would do that, like a little personal Devo time. And anyway, then I like had this crazy desire to read. Like out of nowhere. And I was like, uh, what just happened to me? And so it's not like some like magical thing. I wasn't floating. I didn't feel goosebumps. I didn't like fall over and speak in tongues or anything like that. And I'm not knocking speaking in tongues or any of that. I'm just saying nothing. Like I was brought up very charismatic. There was no music playing. There was no smoke machine. There was no, you know, keyboard player and altar call. None of that. I'm in my house. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? So like there's yeah. no emotional hype. And I just noticed within me, I'm like, I have a desire to read. And I was like, that is not from me, but now it's a part of me. And it was almost the first time where I realized like, wow, God's grace is a mystery. He can actually change you in a way that doesn't go against your will. But at the same time, like you have to cooperate with it because I could have rejected it. Do you know what I mean? Like I wasn't yeah, forced yeah, yeah. to. But you, you but suddenly see, like, had a, a sense that in, like, if, if you, you're, you're trying to figure this stuff out, you're trying to find truth and yeah. reading just clicked. He's like, I, I can find truth through reading. I can, I can well, take some stuff in. Well, see, and I thought the way that I thought before is like, God's going to open up my brain and dump some wisdom in there. Like in the matrix, when he gets hooked up, he's like, oh, I know Kung Fu. <laughs> I thought it's like, that's how prayer works. Just the Holy Spirit will like zap you. Right. And right. I'm not saying that God couldn't do that. I think that's more rare though. And, uh, so this one was like, I realized a little bit later as I was reading, like, oh, wow. God is giving me a desire to read so that I can grow in wisdom. Like instead of just giving me wisdom, like a thing, he's giving me a tool that I didn't have or a grace, like an ongoing grace to now desire to read so I can grow in wisdom. And I was like, that's really cool. So then I started reading like crazy. I was like reading all sorts of Christian theology books and watching YouTube videos. And then I was reading the Bible a lot. Like that would probably be the number one. And that man, like I was reading the gospels and like, I was finding verses I never found before that no one ever preached on. Like, I'm like, what? Jesus said that? What, what the heck? When did he say that? Why have no one tell me that? I'm like, how do I, how do I fit this into my theology? Like, um, so just reading scripture on my own, um, certain things were jumping out to me and like, I would say it was becoming new. And, um, then I, after a while of, you know, reading philosophy and different books and watching like William Craig, Lane Craig videos and, and other people as well. Um, there came a time when like certain things were ironed out. I'm like, okay, God definitely exists. And also like, I've seen an answer to prayer, right? Like I sense his grace at work in me. I'm like, I don't What a mystery this is. This is cool though. So when you and got then, to um, that conclusion that like you, you felt confident God exists, how, like, because I, I had a, a time probably maybe four or five years ago where I was like just really, really bummed out for a while. Uh, right. I, I, I get that. I, I had just gotten back from actually from school and I was like kind of reestablish my roots, right? trying yeah. to reestablish my roots at home. And I didn't feel like I had any really deep relationships. So I, I was just really lonely. And it, I, okay. th during that time, it was like that. That's when I really started to. I don't know, become crowded in by the darkest, darkest part of the, these questions about God. Where, yeah. And it was like, when I came to any sense of a conclusion there, it wasn't like suddenly, oh, I, now I feel like God is real. So now all of this stuff comes back into place and like, I can accept the whole of Christianity again. It was like, that was just 
one tiny little oh, pebble of truth of like, okay, there's something other than me yeah. uh, that that created me. I don't. Yeah. I, I'm going to call that God, but that's the only fact I'm confident about God at currently is just that He's other than me. <laughs> right. Well, but that's a good start because if you don't even believe that there's a God, you can't really move on from there, right? Then Christianity couldn't be true if you're not convinced of like... Right, but how, how do you... Like God. making the leap of, oh, now Christianity's true. That's like a, a lot of statements and a lot of, of theology yes. to suddenly just jump onto. Well, and yes, totally. So if you wanted me to like purely build an intellectual <laughs> argument... Well, I, I'm not necessarily asking you to try to b build the argument, but I, I'm... I, I just, I don't know. I, and by the way, I think it can be built. Yeah. Like St. Thomas Aquinas does a great job. Uh, I would, and I'll also send you some stuff too on, on like Facebook Messenger if you want. Links to um, a Catholic philosopher named Edward Fazer. He's awesome. I, cool, okay. To me, he's sort of like the, the Catholic William Lane Craig. And he was that, anyway, I'm not going to get too into it. <laughs> but he explained St. Thomas Aquinas because I could not understand St. Thomas Aquinas. It's older language. Yeah. And like, he just used like, you kind of have to be a philosopher to even understand it, um, which I'm not. And <laughs> but Edward Fazer was able to explain it in a way where it like clicked for the first time. There's also a really great Catholic philosopher named Peter Kraft. I don't know if you've heard of him before, but I'll no. send you those two guys because okay. they would. He's what well, well, I really like Peter Kraft because he's more like a grandfather. Like he knows how to just speak it very simply without getting technical. Edward Fazer is more like. If you want the give me the like best philosophical technical argument, every single conceivable thing, like yeah, yeah, he's your guy. Um, but um, the reason why for me I was able to continue along is because I I already had relationship with God, like I was having doubts and there were good questions to consider, but at the same time I was like, well. I'm sensing something when I'm reading the Bible, and this is a Christian, like specifically the New Testament, right? So you could say, well, what about Judaism, right? But I'm reading the New Testament, and these are Jesus' words, and they are like really penetrating me. They're really doing something to me. Yeah. And then when I'm praying and doing what it says, I'm seeing something happen. Do you know what I mean? And I, I know they're like, you, it's some bias or whatever, and it's like, sure. okay, like, yeah, you can argue that, but in my experience, I was like getting internal graces that were helping me to, I would say, bridge that gap because it wasn't just purely intellectual. The intellectual argument was relationship that I already established. I think it sort of be like this. Let's say you're friends with somebody and you got a relationship and then someone comes along and they start asking you, like, did you know this about your friend? Did you know this? Like, are you guys actually really that close? And right. they bring up something from his past. Like, and you're like, oh, I shoot. didn't know that. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you're kind of like, uh, wait a minute. Wow. It's like you, you still have like, a sense of a, of a relationship, a history there, but then you have these questions that you're like, well, I still need to kind of figure this stuff out. Yeah. So now there's some obstacles that have yeah. made it kind of weird and complicated. So it's not like I had ever gone full blown atheist or whatever. It was more like, huh, full blown. I, like my <laughs> intellect, since I was older now, I was like, there should be an answer to this. And if there's not, that's a problem. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so I was seeking the answers for them. So, and since I already like God was at work in my life and, and I, I mean, 17 years of being brought up with relationship with God and going to church and reading scripture and seeing answers to prayer, I still had all of that. So like I had a lot going for Christianity, but now what was new is there was a lot sort of seemingly going against it. Right. And so I'm trying to piece them all together. And, um, part of me, I think the, like, rebellious teenager in me was like, wouldn't it be kind of sweet if God didn't exist? Cause then stuff that's a sin doesn't really matter anymore. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, See, well, and that's the almost other... one of the, the, the problems I have with, with the way ethics are taught in Christian circles where it's like, there, there's some, I feel like there's, a, even though the, the whole narrative of heaven and hell is so important for us in our faith. Yeah. It's like when that's the primary motivator to be a good person or to not yeah. be a bad person, then as soon as any sort of doubt comes along, there's no understanding of like pragmatically being good. Like it's just, Oh, I should be good because I want God to bless me. Not because like I should care about other people or because even, even selfishly, like if I'm not good, things are not going to go well for me. <laughs> Right. Well, one difference I would say is like in Christianity, certain things are 
seen as sins when in secular culture they're not. Right. right. But right. I think everyone would agree, like being a jerk to someone, you're not supposed to do that. So it's not like, oh, I'm going to go kill people now because God doesn't exist. Right? right. It was more like, oh, hey, maybe looking at inappropriate things on the Internet now, just in the privacy of my own home, isn't an offense to some being in the sky who's going to send me to hell. Right. Right. right? Now, again, that's a caricature. I'm not saying that's Christianity. Do you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah. 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 But like you can have this kind of idea. Um, and uh so, but again, like, the, by the way, that's not my mindset, right? I'm just sort of saying like, <laughs> there were parts of me that were like, oh, if God I could definitely real, say that there, there, there was great. times where that was my mindset and that there was yeah. a motivation to not want to. <laughs> but I also real, but there's the other side too, is like, wait, it's actually, it's actually way worse if God doesn't exist because there's really no purpose to life. Like it's just in the words of uh, Richard Dawkins, I think he said, uh, um, Oh, what did he say? It, like, it's just blind, random, like pettiless indifference. I think that's something that he said. Yeah, he's he's uh, he, he he really doesn't like religion. <laughs> um, and I guess for for me, it was like, wait, I, it anyway. I, I think it's way more depressing if God doesn't exist. But that's not why I'm a Christian because I think the alternative is depressing. Right. Right. But I think some of the atheists that were more like, um like atheist philosophers that were like followed the logic where it leads there. It's pretty dark. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. Yeah. Not all of them. And again, I'm not saying atheists I, I are feel like people or they can't do anything. Even good. The, I'm not saying any of the that. position of being an atheist is kind of a, like, I feel like you can only be an atheist if, if previously you were a Christian, <laughs> like most people, it, it Right. It's like, it, it's not even an identity. It's an anti-identity. It's just like, well, I don't like that. So I'm going to go join a club of, 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 I hate religion. Yeah. I think a lot of atheists in the past, uh, like famous ones, again, I, I'm not a historian. And so I'm yeah. speaking pretty generally here. I'm not an expert in this area, but yeah, I, it's not false to say that many atheists were brought, were brought up in, you know, a Christian environment and were themselves brought up most likely Catholic. You know, if we're going yeah, back yeah, yeah. in time in Europe, like everybody was Catholic, basically, you know, uh, in a certain time fr frame. Um, and yeah, if you're upset or some suffering happens in your life and you're mad at yeah. God, then you can kind of take it out at him and not follow him anymore. And then just be like, you know what? I don't even think it exists because if God yeah. is loving and all powerful, then like, why the heck would he let this happen? So right, there's no right. way he exists. And that's I love, like the best argument against God is suffering. That's the number one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. So yeah, I think a lot of Christians, when suffering happens in their life, and then hell, a lot of people have a hard time with hell. Yeah. Suffering in hell, man. That's that's going to get a lot of atheist mindset going. By the way, it's not like when I became Catholic, everything magically became better. If anything, last <laughs> year was like the hardest year, or the last two years were some of the hardest years of, of my life spiritually. Okay. So it's not all like rainbows and butterflies and wow, amazing graces and everything's just wonderful when you become Catholic, you know? Well, okay. So let's, let's get, let's get back to there then for a second. So how, like what, what, again, what landed for Catholicism that, that just you right. know, regular, or at least the, the Christianity that you had been handed down from your parents and your community wasn't doing. So then I would say like, okay, I'm confidently Christian as far as I understood Christian, like evangelical. I, I would, I never identified as Pentecostal though. I was brought up Pentecostal, but I would never would, if someone asked me, what are you? I would say a Christian. Mm -hmm, okay. I would never say I'm Pentecostal. Was, was there some sense of like, I don't really want to be associated with these nuts? No, 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 <laughs> no, no. Cause that was like the only, that was like the only community that I knew. And right, I, okay. I loved the community. I did see things that were, I thought unhealthy in that community, but any community is going to have unhealthy stuff. Like even in right. Catholicism, there's obviously like, there's going to be sin anywhere you go. <laughs> like there's going to be problems anywhere yeah. you go. So, um, but there's a difference between like problems in practice and then actual like errors in doctrine. You know what I mean? Like those are different things. Okay. So, um, and then also people's moral culpability, right? So it's not like I'm making a blanket statement. They're like, oh, Pentecostals are wrong. And are, you know what I mean? It's like, I can't, I can't make that judgment. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. I grew up Pentecostal. I didn't know anything else. God's going to judge me on what I know. 
Do you know what I mean? And I know I had relationship with him and he was at work in my life. Do you know what I mean? And I think I was actually brought up very, uh, very fundamentalist in this, like this very rigid dichotomy of like, it's either like you are like almost like a light switch, like, okay, I'm a Christian. So boom, hundred percent on or like, right. No, I'm, I'm not, I have one thing wrong. So like, I'm, I'm totally zero. I'm just dead in sin and right. nothing. I got nothing. And it's like, no, like any relationship, there are degrees and God sees your heart. And, and, uh, so you're saying anyway. that you're a non-binary Christian. Whoa. Well, I wouldn't <laughs> want to eat that too. <laughs> uh, sure. I, uh, again, it's, sorry. No, Evan and I were just, we're just talking about that earlier. It totally. Oh, you have different context. <laughs> what, what, what wound up happening was I um, then had questions about like, then Calvinism came into the picture as I started watching more videos and things like that. So Catholicism was never on my mind. Right. I didn't like the only Catholics I'd even heard of. I'd only really just kind of heard of Catholics. You know what I mean? It was all hearsay. And it was like, they don't even go to church. They don't even know their Bible. Do you know what I mean? And I was I, like, I always heard from like people in my community that like, you know, I think some Catholics will go to heaven. <laughs> well, hey, that, that's a lot better than, than some people's point of view. Right? Um, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, no, I know. See, and that's another thing that I think can be really dangerous in certain Christian circles is almost being obsessed with the state of people's souls. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's like, that's God's job. That's, your that's... job is to love on people. And if it's your place, depending on your relationship, to lovingly like correct somebody. Like I discipline my kids all the time because that's yeah. my responsibility. But it's, right? it's not your responsibility to like correct It's your not my job to micromanage people's yeah. lives or like, uh, yeah, like whistleblow at every moment. Like I'm some the, perfect person that the has whole, it all together. The whole like, can, I don't know, the, the whole experience of like, of evangelism and how that was taught, I felt like in our community was just like, you better be oh. telling everyone how to live all the time because you get it and nobody else does. Yeah, see, and that's what I, yeah, it's very dangerous. It's like, I have it all together and you're an unsaved, un, <laughs> yeah. you know, regenerated heathen. And again, I, I'm probably painting a caricature here, but you know what I mean? Like an ongoing yeah, yeah. idea in certain circles is like, I'm woke and you're not. Exactly. Yeah. I like, and, I like the woke language there. Yeah. I, I heard that from a, a Catholic speaker. He's really good. You know what? Yeah. I got to send you a bunch of okay. guys. <laughs> and and some girls too. Their sister Miriam's awesome. I should tell you. Oh man, there's so much. Oh my goodness. Oh yeah. It's, you're going to feast, man. You're going to have a, okay. uh, <laughs> an intellectual and heart feast. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Um, so I, I was basically stuck between Calvinism and Armenianism. Okay. Now, that was always a fun, <laughs> fun but here's flame the war. Thing, that, I thought that's all there was. Right. So I was like, these are my only options within what I thought. Like, I thought that was it. Because again, Catholicism at that time, I didn't even think was really Christian. I was probably the point of view you had is like, maybe some are Christian and like, I don't know how that works, but whatever. That's some weird kind of yeah. like old, I kind of saw it as like a pharisaical thing. It's like okay. they got a lot of dead tradition and just like this dead, boring, like they don't even know what they're saying. They just repeat prayers. Like they don't read the Bible. They just worship Mary and all the sort of kind of, then I found out none of that's true, but <laughs> um, what was, uh, or, oh yeah. So I'm watching videos. I'm watching like debates between Armenianism and uh, Calvinism and Calvinism was sounding like it was making a lot of sense intellectually, but I still had intellectual problems with it. I was never full blown, but it really reformed doctrine really had an effect on me because it made sense. And they had their proof texts, which seemed pretty airtight. It yeah. was like, Okay, wow, that Romans passage, uh, yeah, seems pretty pretty airtight with yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I definitely <laughs> had I, there was there was a couple of key guys who were evangelizing Calvinism in the in the school that I went to too. They were just like, yeah, it, so it was like a lot of James White. I don't know if you know James. Oh White yeah, he actually spoke at our school. Oh wow. Okay. So yeah, I was watching a lot of James White, a lot of guys like that. I was watching like Paul Washer. Do you know Paul Washer? Mm, no. He is uh, not to be confused with Paul Walker. Okay. Uh, Paul Washer is, yeah, like a reformed uh, preacher. 
Kind of like, I think Spurgeon would be like his hero. Uh, okay. Very gifted speaker. And uh, yeah, so people like that really had an effect on me, but I still had intellectual problem with it. And I think I was growing up more on the Arminiasts land that it's like, look, God, yes, you can't do it on your own, but at the same time, you're not some like inactive thing where God just sort of turns you on and regenerates you. Yeah. And I was like, and if it is that way and he loves us all and died for us all, then he would do that to everybody. Yeah. But then I See, heard the Calvinist doctrine that's like, yeah, but he doesn't do that for everybody because he only died for the elect. Right. <laughs> and then I'm like, wait, that means he didn't die for everybody. Right. Which to me clearly contradicts scripture and also would mean that God then doesn't actually really love everybody. Yeah. Which is a huge intellectual problem. Yeah. <laughs> right? Because, it, well, I mean, it seems pretty obvious. Have, have you read um, The Great Divorce? No, I should though. The, he has uh, so it's, that's Lewis's whole like he, I, I'm sure you know he like he does like his his myth of heaven and hell, or right. like I, he, I've heard I should read it. I I've actually gone on a fast from reading. Okay. Yeah, well, I, we can talk about that later because <laughs> there there reading. is such such thing as like too much of a good. Thing. Oh, for sure. So God used reading and intellect for many many <laughs> years that brought me into Catholicism. And so that was sort of my go-to, like, oh, man, I'm reading, I'm watching apologetics videos, I'm eating up this, I'm, I'm watching this, I'm like, yeah, I'm learning my faith, blah, blah. But then I eventually hit a point where it's like, okay, that's not the only way to get close to God. And also you do hit a point where it's like, oh, my goodness, I thought I knew a lot. I know nothing. <laughs> I know nothing. Yeah. Well, I shouldn't say no nothing, but it's like there's still so much and God is so above and beyond there will always be questions and that the beauty of Catholicism is they know that and they just call it mystery. So right. it's called the mystery See, of the yeah, Trinity. That, so I, I've been, there, there's some guys I've been paying attention to on YouTube recently who are like kind of part of the Orthodox tradition. Right. And, yep. and they have that word too, but well, it's like, that's because well, they're, they're based. I mean, Orthodoxy and, and Catholicism, like we have the exact same, history for the first yeah. thousand years. Like they have all seven sacraments. They have a valid priesthood. Like there's, there is not much, uh, we're in schism. You okay. Know? I, I, I want to ask about, about those two terms you just said in a second, but, okay. um, but as far but as not, talking about mystery, not all of the, but do know, uh, maybe you do know this already though. There are many Eastern rites that are within full communion with Rome though. So you will see, um, like Byzantine Catholic, for instance. Okay. Um, where it would look exact, like it basically is exactly as orthodoxy, except they are in full communion with, with Rome. Um, and then there's other Eastern Christians that aren't quite there yet. But okay. I, th 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 this, you know, we pray what, for what you're saying right now is like, I, I, I need to, I need to get some context to even understand what's going on here. Cause okay, I, okay. I don't even like, so it sounds like now you could maybe start to explain what are some of the key differences between like, so like my understanding of Catholicism from like a very sheltered uh, evangelical point of view was like, right. Oh, those are the people who uh, think you can pray to Mary and, uh, and they probably don't know their Bible very well. And they do these weird things called catechisms and, Oh, catechism and that's is great. That means to learn the faith, like yeah. to teach Christian doctrine. So what I'm saying is that I, I really know very, very little about what, what Catholicism has to offer that, that I, well, you know, okay. You know what? I'm going to, I'm going to speed this up for you. So I thought I was stuck between Arianism and Calvinism and both seem to make good points, but I, I never fully went to uh, Calvinism because not only because there was something in my gut saying this can't be right. Like at the end of the day, I was like, this almost makes God out to be a monster. Yeah. Uh, like this is not the loving God I know from scripture or from experience. But then what happened was um, I started dating this girl. She was Catholic. That's the and, way it uh, happens. Pardon? See, that's the way it happens. No, no, I, and I, didn't, uh, I didn't marry her, though. So I don't want you to think it was. But that's sort of what happened was. But suddenly Catholicism dating, was hot. No, no, no. <laughs> no, actually, what wound up happening was as the relationship became more serious, I started realizing like, oh shoot, she's Catholic, man. Like 
if if we're even thinking of getting married, like we need to have a conversation because right. I'm not becoming Catholic and I'm not raising my kids Catholic. She's going to have to like switch over. <laughs> okay. So I had a conversation with her and I was like, I think we need to talk about Catholicism. And I was like, we, you know, we got a good relationship and yeah. you like, you obviously have some kind of relationship with God. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I think it was like the first time I actually began to know someone who was a Catholic. It, for the first time in my life, I'm actually right. getting to know someone and have relationships. So now there's a person. Yeah, it's not just a caricature. Yeah. And then I was like, and obviously, like, if you're dating someone, it's like someone you're, it's not just, oh, I have a work colleague I kind of know who's Catholic. It's like, no, there's an invested relationship here. And I see this person has a heart for God and prays, and we seem to have a lot in common. So I said, look, I've got some issues with Catholicism and like, and at the time I was a worship leader at a Pentecostal church in Hamilton. And I was like, I right. like, I'm not becoming Catholic and I wouldn't want my kids Catholic. Like you'd probably have to become Protestant for this thing to work. Right. And she was like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> like, she, <laughs> and she was like, she was like, well, before that happens, she was like, what's your problem with Catholicism? And right. I was like, oh man, where do I start? <laughs> you know? So for the first time, I actually asked a Catholic. Now, here's the great thing. She actually knew her faith. Right. I never met a Catholic who like could answer any of the questions I had. So I asked, you know, all the typical ones like, Mary, what's the deal with confession? Why do you have to go to a priest? This, that, and the other. Now, she didn't answer, you know, crazy long, but she answered well enough to make me think. And also she would answer me like, oh, no, no, we don't think of it that way. No. Yeah. And then she would say, it's, you know, this, that, and the other. And I was like, oh, if that's what you believe, I don't have a problem with that. I was like, right. no one ever told me that. I was like, that's kind of cool. Yeah. So it was like the first time I actually had a conversation with a Catholic who knew their faith well enough to make me realize that I didn't actually really know Catholicism. All I knew was a straw man. Yeah. And so it hit me. I was like, man, I'm judging a billion people. Right. And I've never read one official Catholic document myself. Yeah. It's all hearsay from like Bob Jones textbooks. <laughs> Truly. That's it. I, I was listening or ex, yesterday. Or ex-Catholics who have an axe to grind because they had a bad experience. Yeah. 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 Right. I, I was listening just recently. Phil Vischer put out a podcast talking. I, I think that the title of the episode is a brief history of young earth creationism. And he yes. starts, it basically goes through uh, the story of like, why it even became a position because the the reason that that was even taught in our in our circles was specifically one guy i think mostly yeah. ken ham recently is like the one who just put a, a bunch of kind of anti old earth uh yeah like advertised well, that to Kent all of the christian and ken hovind were pretty uh, yeah and ken hovind yes yeah. <laughs> have you seen ken hovind's little thing on on, on ali g did you ever see the, the interview where oh yeah I've that seen was that so good i've seen he's still doing his thing he still does like whack an atheist like whack -a yeah oh it's man not, <laughs> uh, it's not it's that guy is so funny to watch we got you know what like when i was younger i used to laugh at some of these things and now like it's hitting me more i'm like man this is this is a real guy like he needs yeah. prayer you know what i mean yeah, like yeah, yeah. god loves him and yeah, like we can still laugh. I know what you mean. Like we can still laugh at certain things like, well, what, what are you doing, man? Like, I, I feel like I can more laugh because I feel like I'm partially laughing at myself because there was a time when Kent Hovind was my hero. Yes. Yeah, and and exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yep. I totally understand. I remember I would watch debates and be like, he's the man. He's, he's killing he, all like, these listen, listen to these awesome apologetics. He's he's going to have these guys. He's just yeah, got he's them between his fingers. He's taking on three evolutionists yeah. on his own. <laughs> yeah. So, um, sorry. So, we're so when I was talking with her, she had decent answers. And it was the first time I was like, maybe I should actually look into Catholic, not, how do I say, like, why don't I go to official Catholic sources? Mm -hmm. Right? Like, I don't know, go to a Catholic website and sure. see what they have to say. Um, anyway, what wound up happening is, um, yeah, I started reading official Catholic texts, like the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which is free online. Like, um, And I do think, like, again, by God's grace, he was guiding me. Because you can type in all sorts of stuff and find websites that call themselves Catholic, and it's still not going to give you, you know what I mean, like proper information. But you can't go wrong with the Catechism. Like, that's the official... That's the center. 
yeah, you know what I mean? It's like, okay, paragraph this and that so, explains this, that, and the other. And again, it's not like they have everything worked out in every single sure, detail. Sure. There's, and that's the wonderful thing too, is they say, they more say what you can't believe. Right. Hmm, it's like, interesting. this is off limits and this is off limits, but have, have fun within these boundaries. Like go nuts within these boundaries. Right. Just as long as you don't is, think is that, that God that, is that such term, and such. Like mystery, is that a, a kind of the category of like, okay, here's all the stuff you can just kind of think about and see what you think about it. Well, there's definitely thing like there's definitely like dogmas like Jesus is God. Yeah. Like that really matters. If you don't think Jesus is God, then there's problems there, you know? Because, well, <laughs> I mean, it should be pretty obvious for anyone that's a Christian. If you don't think Jesus is God, Christianity has a lot of problems. Right. You know, I, well, you can't really call yourself a Christian if you don't think Jesus is God. Like, that's a fundamental Christian claim, is that yeah. Christ is divine. And if he's not divine, then there goes the atonement, and there goes the way salvation works, and there goes the whole, like, it's all, it all falls apart. So the center, then, for, for, of Catholicism and evangelicalism is still pretty consistent. There, there There's not, like... Were, were there some some big hurdles to kind of like, oh, I need to... Oh, yeah. Tons. But here was the thing. Now, uh, now there were different... Then I was finding different people like Scott Hahn and Tim Staples and Jimmy Akin and Peter Kraft and the list goes on and on and on. All these Catholics... And actually, what's funny is a lot of them were Protestant pastors. And a lot of them were Reformed. So they had been pastoring, you know, Presbyterian churches for 30 years. Right. And when they were doing their doctorate, or returning back to school or on a sabbatical, you know, they somehow like Catholicism is not on their mind or they're anti Catholic, so they never really looked into it. Right. But then something, you know, triggers whatever and they start looking into it. And then all of a sudden they're going, wait a minute, there might be something here. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. Or certain verses they kind of had to put to bed that they never really fit in with their theology that bothered them. Now they could actually fit them in if Catholicism's true. And it's like, yeah. oh my goodness, like, well, well, so I, I, I for for all those guys, because like even within the name of of being Protestant, there's this idea of you're you're a community that's part of a protest against Catholicism, yeah. against against the main core of of the faith. So, yeah. like, it, it kind of makes sense that most Protestants are kind of like <laughs> anti-Catholic. Yeah. I, I, I wish what, that what wasn't I the case. Like, I know many, but, many, many Protestants that would not identify that way. They don't see that name as like they protest against the Catholic church sure, sure. or they're anti-Catholic. They, they well, that's see, what I was would see is, me as is, a fellow brother in Christ. Is there, is there a large sense of even, even the, those guys you're talking about who were previously Presbyterian or various other denominations when they made it, you know, they felt like they had, they seen the light and now, now they're in, now they're Catholic. Is there a lot of anti no other? Okay. No. See, and that's the difference. A so lot of times you when, see the church as like, were the church well, like when Catholics leave Catholicism to go to perhaps a Protestant denomination or something, a lot of times they will be anti Catholic. Yeah. Right. They're like, I didn't get anything there. I wasn't fed there. I never had a personal relationship with Jesus. It was all just like, you know, and so they're, they can be quite anti Catholic. Not all of them, but a lot of them would be. Sure. But, and a lot of times people leaving Catholicism didn't know their faith. It's usually like, I didn't know what was going on. Like I got bad teaching and so they leave. The Catholic converts on the other hand are usually like Protestant pastors who know their stuff and teach Bible studies and like have their doctorate and this, that, and the other. And after like 40 years of faithful study, they're like, Catholicism is true. Yeah. And they have a lot to lose. Like there, there goes their yeah, career. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're saying bye to this congregation that they, do you know what I mean? And they're not anti it. Right. They just if feel any, like they I appreciate need to, that tradition. Yeah. That was their introduction to God and prayer and scripture. And all of what was true in that community still is true in Catholicism. In Catholicism, yeah. there's just more. And there's probably some tweaking you have to do. Right. But depending on where you're coming from, it may not be all that much. Like for my wife, she barely had to tweak a thing. And I was really shocked. I'm like, man, were you Catholic all along? And you didn't even know it? <laughs> she kind of was. It was like, she just, right. Cause anyway. Well, I mean, that kind of just 
asks the question of like, okay, so you identify with a denomination, but it's like that doesn't necessarily say that much about what you personally believe because oh. it's only the people who are like, you know, self-identified theologians who like are going to spend enough time fixating on all the theological intricacies of their particular brand of the faith that they like, they really line up with that label where it's like mostly a, a, a denominational label is more going to have to do with just, well, this is the community I'm part of. Right. Uh, I guess what I was trying to say though, is a lot of, a lot of ex Catholics, they left the church cause they didn't know right. what they were leaving. Sure. They, they okay. weren't well catechized when people coming into Catholicism are studying their way in. Like they're really thinking it through yeah, yeah, yeah. and there's sacrifice involved. Right. And so I, I'm just saying like hearing their story uh, was really pivotal to me because they were bring they knew how to speak Protestant, like Protestants and Catholics speak different languages. Yeah. Yeah. They really do. They use terminology differently. So a lot of times Protestants and Catholics speak past each other. Yeah. And that's where a lot of the miscommunication comes in. And like a Protestant doesn't know any other way to speak. Right. Like you just, you grow up in a certain right. environment. It's you your just dialect. Take it for granted. Yeah. Like you're used to people just getting that phrase or that term, but it's completely different cultures, totally different in many, many ways. What I think is like super fun about that though, is that when you get put in that situation where somebody suddenly doesn't understand all of the jargon you're used to throwing around in your community, right. suddenly yeah. you have to actually think of like, they ask you, what do you mean by that? And you're like, Oh, oh shoot. what, yeah, what, what do, do I mean? mean by that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, the thing too is like, people still know I'm a convert yeah. like Catholics that are cradle Catholics. I remember I was hanging out pre COVID um, at uh, a friend's house and her, her boyfriend who was a seminarian, right. I'm pretty sure was a cradle Catholic. He had just met me, right? Like we shook hands and um, I don't, I'd only said like a couple sentences or whatever. And then I I think she said, Oh, they're, they're converts or whatever. He's like, or and I think he said like, oh, I knew it. Or he asked like, are you a convert? <laughs> He's like, you have like Protestant youth pastor vibes. <laughs> I was like, well, wow. I was like, yeah, you kind of nailed it. He's like, I could tell, man. He's like, you just reek, you reek Protestant. Like, and I was like, really? I've been Catholic for like six years, man. But again, that's pretty young. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Only six years as a Catholic. Like, anyway. Um. So where were we? Uh, well, so do you pray to Mary, Tyler? That's the question. Yeah. So here, what I want to define is the word pray. Okay. Because that's where we can get off the rails already. <laughs> what Catholics mean by that is that we ask Mary to pray for us. Okay. So I can ask you to pray for me. I can ask my mom to pray for me. I can ask saints in heaven to pray for me. Hmm. And that's not necromancy. I'm not conjuring up spirits and doing witchcraft. Right. You know, the love of God does not separate. Like, we're all in the body of Christ. Right. And but I mean, so, obviously, there's a, there's a difference between asking me to pray for you and asking Mary, because like, you, I can heaven? physically hear you and you could hear me say, yeah, dude, I'll pray for you. What, how does sure. that, is there a dynamic of like... Well, I, I, again, yeah, there is a difference, but what I'm saying is there's also a difference in if you think pray means to talk to God. Right, right. And if yeah, I yeah. say I pray to Mary, then I'm a, I'm saying that she's God, and sure, I'm not sure. saying that. So that's why I have to define pray. The old English word for pray is to ask, like to ask earnestly. Sure, yeah. So when Catholics pray to Mary or to any saint, what we're doing is we're we're asking them to pray along with us and to pray for us. Just hmm. like that's that's so a really I mean, interesting. I, I can imagine that'd be a, a a great sense of like weird like community into the past of like oh I, I'm I can talk to all of these people throughout history of, of yeah like I asked Saint Paul to pray for me right like, let's that's, say I'm reading that's Romans a very and I don't get it I'd be like me. Saint Paul can you please pray for me I don't know what you're saying that's that sounds so nuts to me man that's that's like I know not that I mean that like, it sounds like necessarily wrong but that's like very interesting <laughs> no here's the thing you know what your dad asked me about this yeah. He said, what about asking saints to pray? He's like, yep. you can't talk to dead people. And I said, what about the Mount of Transfiguration? Jesus talks to Elijah right. and Moses. Yeah. And your dad said, it was probably silent for like a minute. Yeah. Because you could tell he was thinking. And yeah. he was like, okay. And then kind of switched the subject. Yeah. No, I'm, I talked to your dad for hours on the phone. We went back and forth on emails. Really? And, no, no, and it's good. Like, I was not yeah. offended. 
because in love he was going, I'm concerned for Tyler. I think he's right. going, you know, into a dangerous yeah, you know, yeah, liberal yeah. kind of area. So out of love for That's me. That's so funny that we would consider Catholicism more liberal than even evangelicalism. <laughs> Well, again, I'm not, again, I think he was concerned that I was yeah, going yeah, down a yeah. long road and getting into heresy and out of love for me, he was challenging that. So yeah. I, I'm all for that. There was nothing like ill willed about what he was doing. Uh, so I appreciated what he was doing. And um, so, but we would talk and what was really good is there were times when your dad was like, I'll have to think about that. Yeah. You know, like, I guess he had never heard those responses. Yeah. You know? And, um, and then I remember the last conversation we really had about it. He was like, you know what, Tyler, I'm not concerned for you anymore. Hmm. He, I think he kind of said like, if God's calling you to the Catholic church to maybe make some kind of difference there, he's like, I'm not concerned <laughs> for make... your soul. Was, so yeah, I yeah. guess he was sort of like, you're an anomaly to me. Like, I still think you're a Christian, even though I don't agree with Catholicism. I haven't right. quite worked that out, but like, I, like you've really made me think here. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like so. How do you feel like, about that kind of attitude of like, because this is something I, I've been talking about my talking to my dad about a little bit. Like, what? When is it micromanaging and when is it like keeping a brother accountable? Like, cause right. th yeah, there's yeah, got to yeah, be a, a line, line there between just like trying to tell people how they're allowed to think about things and not being okay with them disagreeing you about things. And you know, it really depends on the person and their temperament. I think I can't give yeah. you like a one size fits all. The thing is like, I'm pretty fine with controversial conversations yeah, yeah. or confrontational conversations. Cause I'm like, I actually really enjoy those kind of, if they're fruitful. Yeah. Like if you're actually asking and want to know, but I like, there's no way that I'm going to, especially on social media, like just go back and forth, like echo chamber type stuff. Like, or you, I, you've already made up your mind. You just want to attack me. Like, I'm not going to bother with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But your, your dad was genuinely bringing up things that I thought through myself. But then when I would respond, he was like very honest back. He's like, wow, you've really made me think about that. Do you know what I mean? Like your yeah. dad showed humility. He, he never came across to me like, I know more than you and you're going to hell right now. You know what I mean? Like what your dad did to me, I think was totally fine. Uh, and, and I appreciated it and it was civil and I think we had really good conversation and it, and it ended quite well. Like, so I have no, I had no problem, but okay. maybe if you're his, well, you are his son, yeah. <laughs> maybe there were times where you felt that your dad was overbearing, but again, you have a different relationship with your dad. And I sure, think sure. any child at some point in their life has felt that their parents were overbearing. Yeah. And maybe they were like, they're not well, perfect people. There, there's just been a, sort of an interesting dynamic of, I don't know, we, we've been talking about that, that particular type of relationship in a couple different contexts, but like right. watching, uh, I guess a, a friend of ours got a divorce and it was like, right. well, was it my responsibility to go in and, and talk to him and make sure that he, you know, before making the decision to get right. divorced, I should have, I should have been involved in that situation. And I was like, well, I mean, maybe, but maybe like maybe that uh, wasn't your role. It's like, it probably depends. Um, I guess a good rule of thumb is like, will they even accept what you're going to say? Exactly. If you already know, no, then don't bother. Right. <laughs> like if you, and if you really feel, I know this is going to sound cliched, but sometimes we think it's the Holy spirit impressing something on us and it's just our idea. So you really have to discern like, is God well, calling me to talk to this person? That's, that's if an is, interesting you do it. question. Like, in your life and, and feeling like you have a, a relationship with the Holy Spirit, what, what does that mean to you? And when do you really feel like you've, you've heard from God? Um, with God, there's a clarity. It's like you, oh man, it's, it's very hard to explain. Because I remember for like you a year, see. I was like, because the, the school I went to was very charismatic and it was like, you know, you oh, okay. need to just ask God about everything. Wait, I thought it was a James White type school. He's no, not... no, dude. It was, it was very. Because uh, he is not charismatic. No, no. It, no. It, 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 when he came, it was like it was a it was a debate he was having with our um, oh, our uh, school president. It, it was pretty that fun. makes sense. <laughs> okay, I was like, 
James the, White at a charismatic school? Like, what's going on? But this this school is literally called Fire. It was a very fiery, charismatic. Mm-hmm. Like, it was all about the uh, uh, what do you call the for, the Pentecost? It's all well, like, yeah, I mean, uh, Tongues of Fire right out of Acts. Yeah, like, Catholics exactly. Have no problem with that. Super, Go super ahead and excited name about that. Fire. So, like, one a Catholic prayer that I pray pretty much every day uh, is to the Holy Spirit. Right, come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle within them the fire of your love. Mm-hmm. Well, there's more to it, but but like we use that term, the fire of your love. Uh, I, I I I like the idea of of having community prayers that you have memorized and stuff too. That's oh man, oh Catholic prayer, man, changes your life. Changes your life. It's awesome. Uh, that's you know what you, you that's gotta, what you I would share say. some of like, that with me you can do the intellectual stuff but i would say actually try out some of the stuff yeah oh for sure that's the big difference it would be like you're reading about swimming and then you actually go swimming yeah <laughs> right so i was reading about stuff and intellectually stuff was happening but there came a point where i was like i actually have to try this ask mary to pray for me thing okay and i will give you a practical okay tell me example. about the first okay. time you did that tell me tell me about the experience you had with this and again i asked god to forgive me in advance if this was wrong <laughs> That's, I like that. I said, I said, God, this feels so foreign to me and so weird. Yeah. And I said, and if this is wrong, please forgive me. I said, but I'm doing this because I'm like, this seems okay. Right. And, and I'm going to, the only way I can know is if I try it. So I was just trying to like tell God my heart, like I'm not trying yeah. to go against you, but like, there's a lot of stuff here that makes sense to me. And so I kind of have to try it out. Yeah. I don't know if this was the first time that I did, um, but it's v- at the beginning stages, definitely. I um, was being tempted um, to, uh, well, okay, I was being tempted to look at porn. Let's be very frank. So it came on strong, and uh, I was praying to God, like, God, please help me. I don't want to give in to this. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I totally. And um, again, you're going to say, well, how did you know? Whatever. I'm just going to have to tell the story. I felt like the Holy Spirit said, ask Mary to pray for you. And I was like, what? Hmm. In me, I was, I was, I had an aversion to it. I was like, why, why don't I just go straight to Jesus? Why the heck am I going to like do this roundabout? You know, like, well, right. wh- why? But that's all that was said. And then it kind of went away. Do you right. know what I mean? Which is, but like, it was there. Like I was f- kind of fighting it. And I'm like, what the heck am I fighting? You know what right. I mean? And so I said, um, okay, whatever. I'm going to try it out. I'm just going to try it out. Okay. Now it doesn't always work this way. I think the reason why it happened the way it did is because God was trying to confirm something for me because this was a pivotal moment in my life. Okay. So I said, Mary, I am being tempted. Please pray for me. And it went away immediately. Like it was gone. I had no desire. And I was like, and I was even like, that was weird. Like, why? Like, I even went to God and was like, God, why did that work? Like, what the heck? Do you know what I mean? But here's yeah. here's what I would ask you. So that was really cool. That was amazing. Yeah. Okay. Why? And it doesn't always work that way. I asked Mary to pray for me and it's not like the the very moment. This, this right? is but, the one that works. I finally figure out how, how to make prayer actually get answered. Just pray to Mary. Right. Instead. It's not some, su- that's the thing. Catholicism is a hundred percent against superstition. Right. Right. Like you can't force God to do anything. Right. right. Like God's going to do what he but wants But I mean, to do. but he's got to listen to his mom. Well, see, that's the mystery. <laughs> well, okay. So here's the thing. Did Jesus have to obey his parents? Are you asking me? Yeah. I mean. Because you have prob- to honor your mother and your father. That's one of the Ten Commandments. Yeah. Well, I mean, but so, so there may be cases where honoring them doesn't, be, doesn't include obeying them, because especially if they tell you to do something that isn't the right thing to do. Okay. Well, okay. I see what you're saying. But generally speaking, right? Like, Scripture tells us, Old and New Testament, obey your parents and honor them. Yeah. So Jesus would have been an obedient, and it says in scripture, you know, when they find him in the temple and he says, and then he, you know, obeyed them. Yeah. Right. Like he didn't, he definitely didn't dishonor his mother. Right. Like, cause well, that would be yeah. a sin. Jesus well, didn't I mean, sin. If, if I'm trying to like work out what might bring, bring honor to my parents, then it's like, there might be, th- there might be times where 
I, I am, I, I'm not as, it's like in order to, to honor them, to, to like bring honor to them in the, in the long term, maybe I'm not even truthful to them in the moment, or maybe I'm not, I'm not going to do exactly what they want me to do. Okay. Right. Uh, well, I, I guess I see what you're saying. I think you know what I'm generally saying. Yeah. Though. Like <laughs> Jesus was a good boy. Like he right. didn't, he didn't say, well, I'm trying to like, in for dinner, say, I think probably Jesus in, in his wisdom, in his connected connection to God, the father, it's like he, he knew what was going to bring more honor to, to his parents. Right. Yeah. But I mean, they're, they're uh, I would say like, they're both compatible. Do you know what right. I mean? Like yeah, yeah. God, God chose who his mother was, mm -hmm. you know? So he's got it all worked out. So I guess what, what I mean is, is that Jesus is still fully God, fully man. He didn't yep. stop being human. So, cause he resurrected, right? Like, so that's, what's cool about the incarnation is it's, that's in any, uh, um, an eternal choice that the second person of the Trinity is now forever fully God, fully man. He didn't just like leave earth and now, Oh, now I'm, I'm not human anymore. Right. So the incarnation now is forever, which means that Mary is eternally his mother forever. Right. Right. So what's very cool is, you know, and it is a mystery of course, that the God of the universe would be like, first of all, the incarnation is a mystery, right? We can't fully wrap our minds around right. that. Yeah. How is, how can God become fully God, fully man? Like, how are you hundred percent God, hundred percent man? Cause what the Catholic church said, you can't believe is that he's 50% God, 50% man, or right. like, fully God, but no, just in human form. Like it's like, nope, he's a hundred percent God, hundred percent man. Right. And a lot of heresies were like, that doesn't make sense. We don't get it. We want to get it in our minds. So right. let's make it easier. And the church said, no, you, no, you can't well, see, do that. It, it works. Earlier okay? you said like looking at different, different religions, like you can't have statements that are mutually exclusive and have them both be true. But I think when we look right. at Christianity, right. we see a pretty stark example of, well, actually we do have mutually exclusive statements that we assume no. to be, we say are true. Like you can't, 200% of a person is not a, the way percents work. So we're okay. intentionally saying this is something that we know is a paradox and doesn't make any sense. And we want to keep it that way. Okay. So this is, I would make a distinction that there are things that can't be true because they are contradictory in what they sure. say. So for instance, if you say Jesus is God, and then you say Jesus is not God, those can't both be true. And the church doesn't make that kind of logically false contradictory claim. But there are certain things that are above reason that actually logically they're not wrong. Like the, uh, an Edward, I could send you like an Edward Fazer thing on this where he gets into it. Like, it's not actually a logical problem. It's just, we can't wrap our minds around it. Well, I, I would, I wouldn't be so nervous about saying that it's a logical problem because I think if God is, God may be deeper than logic. It's like logic is a is a means of trying to understand things and it's like if this is the very bottom of reality then w it doesn't have to fit into the box of logic <laughs> well uh i guess i would be careful that um that um like the faith is reasonable because if we just throw out logic then yeah then you do walk well, into the problem I, of, i'm not well, trying to say any... that we should throw out logic i'm saying that i think any tool that we use to try to discover the identity of god is is intrinsically only going to give us an imperfect image of God. Like we we don't like. I think I'm just kind of going on the the idea of like even the the Moses thing. Like you can't see God and live. It's it's literally impossible right. to be alive and to be human and have understanding and have that understanding perfectly okay. match up with who God is. The, to the best of my knowledge, because again, like I'm trying to represent Catholicism as best as I can. Okay. <laughs> but again, I am there's it's immense, and so I'm I'm doing my best here. From what I know, the Catholic response is that um, faith is reasonable <clears throat> and intellect and reason can take you quite far, but there comes a point where you have to go above reason and go into faith. Okay. And again, that doesn't mean that you're saying bye to intellect, you're saying bye to logic. It's just you do come to a moment where it's like, okay, I can only understand so much. And we're talking about God here. Right. And so there are certain things where it's like, no matter how smart you are, our mind just can't grasp it. Yeah. But God has revealed it to us. Yeah. So we don't know exactly how it works, 
but it's also not a, it's not opposed to reason. It's not like like I, I would want to put it in in the frame of like just different contexts of getting to know a person. Like let's say the only times I ever talk to you are through a, a, a Google Hangouts call. That doesn't okay. mean that the the relationship that we might develop through that call is going to be totally wrong or like actually false. Like it's there's right. there's still I mean it's still going to learn some things about you and and we'll be able to interact right. and get to know each other. But like uh -huh. there's there's a like that's not eating with you. That's not living with you. Like that would be right. a totally different kind of relationship. It is not that like there it's just is experiencing a different part of who you are. Like I'm saying that I think logic. It, it doesn't it just can't encompass anybody oh yeah so yeah exact yeah god transcends it right it's not that it's right? wrong so it's just that it doesn't get the whole picture yeah i edward phaser gives a good uh analogy he sort of sounds like the <clears throat> calls the scientific method like a um or i think he's referring to physics because some people think physics like answers everything yeah right? yeah yeah people that are into scientism where they think science can answer everything uh, like physicists, uh, well, what's his name? It escapes me at the moment. Where they're basically trying to look for the ultimate theory of everything using physics. Maybe ha Hawking? Yeah, but that wasn't the person I was thinking of. Okay. Uh, anyway, he said, um, a metal detector is a great instrument. Like if you go at the beach and you have a metal detector yeah. and you're looking in the sand, you're going to find metal things. But he said, they do that really well but there's a bunch of other things that you might want to find that they will not detect. Right. And you don't want to use it to mow your lawn and you don't want to use it to, right. you know, it has its food place. and it's not going to find a piece of wood under the ground. I, I think though, that just even talking about logic that way in this moment in time is uncomfortable for people because we're like really, really deeply bought into like science and materialism basically. And like, that's the way we understand the world it, in the West, yeah, and but I, materialism just anybody... is is, a, is now a philosophical point of view. It's, right, the science does not prove that. Right, it might. Well, you might science use it to help almost that assumes view, but... that. I mean, they're they're pretty, like. S s s should we, you know what though, should we go back to Catholicism? Because there are so we we need to have many conversations. Okay. <laughs> um, but I just feel like, especially if there's you know people listening, um, I don't want to frustrate them. Uh, well, I don't know if like, anybody's listening anyways. We'll, we'll, we'll see if anybody <laughs> listens to our conversation. Right. Okay. Well, I don't, I mean, it's being recorded. There might be a couple people that, so we'll, we'll but, see what uh, happens. But even no. for the sake of our conversation, yes, okay. we don't so want to, I want to, I, I want to understand a little bit more about, yeah, we'll stay focused a little bit here. <laughs> so I think we were talking about Mary and, uh, okay. I'll keep it really simple. Like, um, I ask my mom to pray for me. And you might ask the same question, like, well, why? Why don't you just go straight to God? And uh, so I would ask you the question, do you ask people to pray for you? And if so, why? Yeah. Uh, like, do you think it helps? Probably, I don't know. Like, the way I would think about prayer... <laughs> well, I mean, I'm assuming you've asked people to pray for you before. Yes. Or and I, I'm trying to think about... Why is it that I do that? What, what do I think is happening there? Um, I'm assuming you think it helps in some way. It's yeah, like, it hey, helps your in prayers some way. are helping me out. Yeah. Right? Like if you're carrying a load and you ask someone to help you carry it, it helps you. Right. It's not like you're not, you're not doing it. You still don't have that burden, but they're helping you out. In the spiritual realm, if someone prays for you, they're, you know, doing an act of love and they're interceding on your behalf. Which we're told to do, like it's all throughout scripture. People are interceding and like stepping in the middle or being, you know, some kind of intermediary. You know what I mean? Yeah. All, all over the place. So like, yeah, I mean, that would be basically like intercession, right? Yeah. So basically the idea is that like, not only can you ask people on earth to pray for you, which is a great thing. And I do that, but you can ask the saints that are made perfect in heaven before the throne of Christ to pray for you. And their prayers are like super powerful. So yeah, th that's, that's interesting. Because, so, so because where, where do we get that perfect. from? Like, I, I assume that that tradition is connected to some biblical reference or some, some proof text or something like that. What, what why is it that, that, you know, well, you know, even if there wasn't, there are proof texts, but uh, even if there wasn't, you just look at the tradition of the church, but from mm -hmm. the very beginning, that was always done. 
so what you'd actually be arguing against is like for 2000 years, Christians have been asking saints to pray right. for them. So it's Protestants that are saying no to something that's it's been a part of what Christi Christianity of does. So it's kind of like, like, sure, you can find stuff in the Bible, but for a lot of people that still won't be enough. So right. that's why Catholics look at the tradition of the church and say, well, ever since the teaching of the apostles, just look at the history, read the church fathers. They all did it. Right. Well, that, that's or another we, angle of like something that I feel like I've totally missed out on in the tradition I grew up with. It's yes. like we don't have any like when you say church fathers, that's like, oh, I have some Christian nerdy friends who have read so, some of that stuff. But like, I don't really know what's in there. I know it's some amazing, names like man. Tertullian, like uh, Polycarp. <laughs> yeah. Here's the thing, okay? These church fathers knew the apostles personally. Yeah. If you go back far enough, we have letters of people that like, you know, the apostle um, Paul or whatever, or, or the apostle John, right? Like ordained them as a bishop. Right. So it's like, okay, this guy hung out with this apostle and like, so if they're saying this about baptism. Yeah very clearly, uh, then I really have to take this into consideration because if they're also unanimous, like if they're all saying that babies are being baptized and that it's not just a symbol, yeah. then how do I fit that into what I was brought up right. with? Because yeah. like all well, the earliest Christians did that and continued to do it. When you, when you try to build a community based on being anti something, you're, you're definitely going to end up throwing a lot of uh, baby baptisms out with the bathwater. So to speak. Well, but even Protestants disagree on that. Most Protestant denominations do baptize infants. Right. And many of them do see it as more than just a symbol. They do see it as a sacrament. Yeah. Like, that's the thing that even like Martin Luther, his view on baptism was way different from your, your yeah, modern yeah, yeah. evangelical. So like if you go back to like the original reformers and stuff like that, they they were way more Catholic than Right. You know what I mean? Like I think well, it's many like now I feel like the part Often, a lot of the communities that I mean that I've interacted with, it's like the theology that is. It's it's just like very small, like you said. That when you when you become a Catholic, there's just more, and it's like I I, yeah. I felt that sort of crampedness in yes. in conversations. It was like I, I felt thoroughly thoroughly bored with any sermon I would hear in church. Probably yes. by the time I was like. You know what? Because you're just going to hear, you basically hit the point where you're just going to hear the same thing. Right. And it's like, this is, there's not enough here. <laughs> yeah. I don't think you're really going to grow anymore. You've kind of maxed out what you can get out of, you know what I mean? Like the community you were brought up in. And I, I you think, I mean? like, when, when I think about that, it's like, I, I, I don't think that that's ne necessarily even, even a terribly bad thing. Like, I, I don't think that necessarily everybody wants to go that deep or like ask a ton a ton of questions like no but what i mean is like at least for me the protestant mindset of church is like okay i sing some songs but then i want to learn something in a sermon right yeah i want to learn i want to learn i want to learn 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 it's all like very book oriented like if i'm learning about god then that means i'm growing closer to god but that's not necessarily the case yeah right when the mass you may not really like learn anything, but it's a prayer. Right. It's the prayer of the church. And there's the sacrifice of the mass, which is the Eucharist. It's just completely different why you go to church. Yeah. Like, totally okay. Totally different. Just walk me, see if you can walk me right through that. Like what, what is the experience of going to church like for you now? Well, right now I can't because of. COVID. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, but so, in the last six years, I guess. Now here's the thing. People's experience are going to be different depending on how they under, if they understand what's going on. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, let's say you go to a wedding as a five-year-old, you're probably going to be bored out of your mind. Right. <laughs> but if you're the mother of the son who's getting married, you're crying your eyes out. Right. Like, this is a magical moment. So if you know that Jesus is present in the Eucharist and you know the history of this whole thing and you realize like, wow, I'm being transported back to Calvary and now I get to partake in this and unite myself to the liturgy in heaven and like, there's so many things, then it's like this amazing wonderful and not that i go to mass and i'm like a lot of times i'm holding two different kids or one pooped and we got to change their diaper like right but um i think the best way to go is you probably have many 
theological quarrels or obstacles or whatever with Catholicism. So maybe the best thing is like, tell me one of the things where you're like, I've got issue here. I've got a problem here. What well, say you to I, that? I, I don't necessarily, I mean, that's not quite where I'm at. I don't think like, oh, I, okay. when it, when it, I, I really, the reason I wanted to talk to you about Catholicism is not because I was like, I, I've got some issues here and I need to, need to work this stuff out. It was just well, like, I, yeah. I, I feel like, well, I remember in the message I sent you initially that I felt like there was maybe a, even a, a misunderstanding. Like I, I said, I've been struggling to try to figure out how to make some version of Christianity work. And you said, right. oh, I'm sorry you're struggling. I'll pray for you. And right. I was like, that's not really what I mean by struggling. I, I, I mean, like, like, I'm excited that I'm struggling. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> Well, like, yeah, just based off your message, I thought like maybe you're going through, you know, a hard time of confusion of you're like, man, I kind of want to rest on something and there's a lot of noise and that can yeah. be really hard. Oh, so I thought maybe that's what you were going through. And I, I guess to some extent I am, but I, I feel like. But you're not discouraged by it. You're sort of like, no, this is I, exciting. It's like an adventure. Yeah. Like r right now I'm just very interesting like like next week i have another friend i'm going to chat with on here and we're going to talk okay. he and his family you know they joined the orthodox tradition which i i right. think is i think there's that's what even something else i wanted to ask you about it is like what if there's a more of a process of becoming catholic or becoming yeah. orthodox but like, yeah, they're like to me it's just just very interesting sure? and i'm like Do you know what you're signing up for what yeah, they're like, are you sure? Do you know what you're signing up for? Like, it's like, this is a big commitment. No, you I don't know. I, I, I don't know what it would mean to be signing up for becoming Catholic or be, being Orthodox. Well, that's that's why they have something called RCIA, which is a okay. process for adults coming into the church of like a few months of like, this is what we believe and like still continue to pray and discern if you really feel that this, this is where God is yeah, leading yeah. you. They don't want you to just like show up to mass and hey, I like it here and I guess I'm Catholic now. It doesn't work that way. Okay. Right, See, that's interesting like, because I feel like a lot of the the entrance to a lot of other you know uh, Protestant denominations is a lot softer, where it's literally just like, yeah, you can be here, and and then well, you're welcome to come. Th there's to only the 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 key to entry is just like, oh, well, you have to repeat this prayer about accepting Jesus into your heart, whether anybody knows what that means or not. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, again, it depends on the Protestant tradition, so I can't speak on each different one. <clears throat> um, but uh, yeah, in our upbringing, it was like, well, you go here and you seem to have a heart for Jesus, so you're in, you know, like, yeah, yeah, you're you're one of us. But again, most people in evangelical church don't even have like a hard position on some of these. Like, it's it, it's just there's basically like a handful of very basic doctrines that, yeah, every Christian would agree on. Like, Jesus died on the cross to save us from sin. And I put my faith in him and I, I want to follow him and obey him and like these sorts of things. And I pray and I read the Bible and God is at work in my life. And I know that there's sin and that's wrong and I don't want to do that. And so I've asked God to forgive me and to help me to live the way he wants me to live. And that's a very good thing. You know, like what Christian would say no to that. Yeah. But then there, but there's more like, okay, there's obviously more like, like in our own life. Well, like, so okay, you said when, you, when you, you go to, to mass, there's this whole new experience of like being brought back to Calvary. And like right. when I, when I, the various different types of church services I've been to is like, okay, here's the exciting concert experience. And then here's the guy who's going to, going to preach for a little while. And sometimes yeah. preaching is interesting. Sometimes it's not, but it's a very, like there, there's two elements to it. And it's very yeah. obvious that this is the time to rock out and have a concert or maybe yep. it's going to be some very bad musicians and you're going to have to cringe through it. Right. Um, and then you're going to have somebody talk for a little while, but like wh what's, what's going on that there's like, a, is there's more symbolism or like what's, what's going on in, in a, in a, in a mass. Right. Oh, okay. Wow. So by the way, I would say, yeah, now that exists in the, in the Catholic world too, but they're called conferences. They don't call it church. Okay. So you can have great music and sing praise songs and worship songs, and then have a great gifted speaker talk about the Bible or right. share their testimony. There's Catholic conferences. There's See, one going I, on right I now. I like that Rise terminology a lot better, actually. <laughs> Pardon? I said I like that terminology a lot better. Well, and and that's the thing is like what a lot of Protestants call church, Catholics call that, oh, that's a Christian conference yeah. where you're going and you're gathering with people and you're praying and maybe there's some, you know, 
different booths set up to, you know what I mean? Like right. to s different, to represent different ministries and things they're doing. You can get plugged in and yeah, we're going to sing some songs together and then we're going to hear a great talk and there's some different key speakers. So, th so that exists in the Catholic world, you know? So, yeah. and we're not against that, but we wouldn't call that church. We'd say that would be a very lacking view of church, that that's all church is for you is sing some songs and then hear a really good talk. Like those are great, but there's so much more yeah. when it comes to what, you know, technically speaking, Catholics refer to as church. But, but again, they call it mass. Yeah. Well, what, mass. what does that word even come like from? Going to church. Is it like a so mass of people mass. are coming together? Pardon? Where does that word even come from? Is it just a, a mass of people are coming together? No, that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. <laughs> and, you know. Hey, Evan, can, can you figure that out? What, where does mass come from? My guess is it's like Latin or something. I don't know. Yeah. I have to look it up. Um, but, oh man, where do I start? Okay, a lot of it goes back to like Old Testament uh, stuff. Oh man, where do I start? Okay, so what is universal is the idea of sacrifice, right? Okay. And that's a key difference. No one in Catholicism offers sacrifice to Mary. If you were to offer like a sacrifice, the, the way that you would to God only, then that, that's idolatry. That would be a, like... Okay, be so, so then be, being a little, to, to clarify, what do you mean then by a sacrifice? Like okay, a, you know when uh, God asked, we're not, we're not uh, sacrificing Abraham. goats on an altar. Exactly. So in the Old Testament you are supposed to offer sacrifice to God. Only. Right. You don't say, who will? So even, even pagans know there's something within every human being, right? Like you look across the culture, even pe like yeah. throughout all of time, people have been sacrificing something to some God. Right. Because that is like the ultimate form of worship of like, I am offering a sacrifice, whether it be an animal or unfortunately there's been human sacrifice and, uh, Right. Or look at uh, the Christian, um, like the most pivotal moment is the atonement, right. where God himself becomes human and offers himself up as a sacrifice to God the Father to redeem the world. So that's the ultimate sacrifice that now we can participate in. Okay? So sacrifice is central to Christianity. Without sacrifice, there, it doesn't make any sense. Right? Like what Jesus did was a sacrifice. Right. But it was a sacrifice of love. It was self-giving love, right? It was Jesus offered his own life and died on behalf of the human family, right? To undo what Adam and Eve did, right? He's the second Adam who's now um, offering okay. up a sacrifice so, of so love. The so, pardon? Well, okay, so it, it sounds like, because even, even the understanding of, of what the meaning of the whole passion story is is right. yeah the catholic point of view is different well yeah like and even because it's because substitutionary atonement that's like a real central central thing for like I, definitely my denomination though that's like when i think about that story and, and what like what jumps out to me and what i find really meaningful is not that's not really at the center of it like when i see and think about and, and read the story of christ dying on the cross it's more like this is Christ teaching me how to how to sacrifice and how to lay everything down for for my friends and and, and how to oh, of course. and how to how to also it's like it's like he's taking on my sin by showing me how to lay down my sin even it's like he's taken all of my sin onto the cross with him and now he's dying and he's saying this is what you do you take up your cross and follow me and you do this you you die on the cross Oh, I, yeah, I agree. We're going to suffer too. We take up our cross and follow him. Um, but our suffering only makes sense in light of Christ's suffering. Like uh, now our suffering has meaning and purpose and it has redemptive power because um, it can, it can be united to Christ's ultimate sacrifice. Right. So, so I can participate in that because I become a member of Christ's body. Right. So I'm united to him. So it, it's, now, it's becomes sort of like, so to you, suffering and and sacrificing in and be part of Christ's sacrifice that's more of almost like a a way of of praising what Christ has done 
Uh, well, it's, it's, it's more than that. Like, uh, well, there's a verse in Colossians, uh, I'd have to find it, uh, where Paul says something pretty, uh, pretty odd for most Protestant ears when he says like, I make up for what's lacking in Christ's sufferings, right? He's like the suffering of my own body. I'm sort of making up for what's lacking in what Christ right. did. And that sounds really odd. It's like, what do you mean what Christ did? You, no one could top that. How are you going to like, and what St. Paul is talking about there is like, we are continue to be the hands and feet of Jesus and we're the body of Christ. And so he wants us to continue to work out what he did in our little sufferings that on their own wouldn't mean anything. But when well, united to him is, is like, is so the how, outpouring of that through us. What is that? What does that mean to be working out? What did you say? Well, working out the, the sacrifice? Well, God's redemptive plan is still in action. It's not all over. It's not the end of time. Right. Right. So like God, what Jesus did on the cross is still at work and we haven't like people are still being transformed by his love. There are still people that, you know what I mean? Like maybe haven't heard or are still kind of like on the fence or like, like it's not over. The story's not over. So God's redemptive plan is still being, I don't know. Do you know what I mean? Like sort of, yeah, I'm trying to, so why is it meaningful us to, for, for us to participate in, in sacrifice? Like, if, if the idea is that Christ literally paid the price for all of our sins, then what, what is us sacrificing anything? What, what does that do? What does that mean? Well, but then it seems with that mindset, it's like there's nothing for us to do. We just kind of sit back and wait for heaven. Like well, it's a waste I, of time here. I, I feel like that is somewhat consistent with, with, with messages I've heard somewhat in, in these circles where it's just like, Christ, it's, it's done. It's, it's over. And we're just kind of now we're just, just praising God. No, oh man, oh, that's a, okay, d see, here's the thing, like, depending on what you mean by that, that's kind of true. Yeah. But if you, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, but, th like, then why does any, then why do we pray? Why do we live? Why do we do what we do? Why, like, wh why doesn't God just wrap it up? If he's doing everything. I think that then, the, like, the, the answer to that out? question that I got growing up was just like, he, he doesn't wrap it up yet because we still got to let everybody know about it at least. And not okay. everybody's so had a chance to hear. That's so, like, our only job. My only like, job is to just tell people well, about Jesus. And and that's that's what I thought was kind of. It felt like a weird. Well, I mean, th that's why I, I saw so many people becoming missionaries in, in the circles that I, I grew up in. It was right. like that. That is the thing to do. There's nothing else. That's our entire purpose for being here is that we need to go but and evangelize. You have to work on your own holiness. Right. Like, like what that, about you? Like that I, doesn't well, matter because like God's already God's already saved me. I'm totally good. <laughs> That's not, that's not true. How are you totally good? Oh, I you're know. just a perfect person. You got nothing to worry about. Right, on? yeah. So, I mean, like, that makes a lot of sense to me, but, like, I, I don't, f I feel like the thrust behind a lot of the, a lot of the communities that I, I've talked to, it was just, like, it's all about, it's all about being a missionary. You know what? I think we've really gotten to the, to a big difference between Catholicism and, it sounds like a very reformed position here. Yeah. So... I'm sure somebody's gonna gonna we're gonna watch this and you'll be like, no, that's not that's not what, what. Right. So I'm not again. I'm not. I don't think you're representing all. And I yeah. sure. I mean, this is. I'm. I'm more just talking about this is how no, I experienced the faith. Yes. So um, Catholics do not believe that um, once you're to use you know the more like terminology that Protestants be familiar with. Once you're saved, okay, you still got stuff to do that's the beginning it's like okay great you're born you gotta like now you have a purpose like god has a plan for you yeah now that you're in this relationship with him and he wants you to grow in this gift that he's given to you right and here's the thing like just because you've started with him doesn't mean you're gonna end with him right like just because i'm married to my wife you know, doesn't mean I'm going to forever remain uh, like I have to work on my relationship and continue to love her every day and grow. Right. If we kind of coast and then we grow distant and then like I, I'm not going to do this, but let's say like I were to cheat or something. Well, now our relationship is very different, right? Some yeah. people end in divorce. Some people like all sorts of things can happen. Right. And so it's like, hey, that's great if you had a conversion experience and you love God and you are wanting to follow him, but it's not like, Oh, that happened in the past and it's all done. 
Yeah. And now it's well, basically I mean, just. I wonder if game. to really enter into the analogy that uh, with, with terminology that would work for this tradition is like we, we talk about it as being born again, right? And so when right. when you're born, that doesn't mean your life is over. It's just begun. It's just but that's starting, right? Like, you're well, you're hey, beginning to done. go and work out your life. Well, yeah, I mean, pretty much most of the New Testament epistles yeah. are talking to Christians, yeah. warning them, guys, what are you doing? Yeah. If you continue in this, don't you know where that leads? Right. Right? And so he's constantly warning them, like, guys, you got to continue. You got to be vigilant. You got to pray. Don't let this happen. Don't you know that people who do this, that, and the other and continue in that, they're not going to inherit the kingdom. Right. And so there's constant warnings from St. Paul and in the other epistles that like, keep the faith, endure to the end. Don't, don't be presumptuous and think like, oh yeah, I'm guaranteed heaven because I prayed a prayer when I was seven. Yeah. You know? So again, and I'm not saying that I'm walking around in fear thinking that I'm going to hell at every moment, right? Like that wouldn't be good either. The idea is, okay, I shouldn't be presumptuous and I also shouldn't be living in constant fear. I trust in God's mercy and in his love, but it's dangerous when you just think like, oh yeah, I'm going to heaven. That, that, that's been dealt with. Right. Right. And it's like, um, well, there's the possibility of maybe you rejecting. Yeah. You know, like Judas was like one of the 12. Which and I mean, it doesn't look the, like the Calvin, John Calvin wants to let you know that Judas was never a Christian. But that's... <laughs> How, what do you, how would he not be a Christian if he's following Christ? Yeah, exactly. like he was yeah, baptizing yeah. people too, working miracles too. So he was, so he's just completely unregener unregenerate that whole time. Right, right. I don't know. There's a, but see that that's the other problem with uh, Catholicism is that, um, sorry, not Catholicism with with Calvinism or certain stripes of Calvinism is that you don't really know if you're elect or not. You yep. can never be certain. Yeah. Which means that, oh man! And if you're not elect, you're screwed. Yeah, you have. There's nothing you can do. Okay, about so to, sorry to jump back to before I was starting to talk about C.S. Lewis's great divorce. He has an awesome chapter just totally discussing this, where he basically okay. comes to the c conclusion that 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 both. I mean, basically, just that the the dichotomy of Calvinism versus Arminianism is just a bad one, and that they're both. They're both latching onto and explaining a really important part of the truth. And that like from the perspective of time has already happened and your life is over. Yeah. You were never like you could look right. at it from the perspective of Calvinism of like, yeah, you never like ultimately you you were not a Christian. So you were never I mean, you were never destined to, or you were never going to end up being a Christian because you didn't. And it's like just a weird time view of time. But that it's like at the same time when you're experiencing a moment, it's like, that's when it comes down to, well, it's just about what you're doing right now. Like, wh where are you going to go? See, I think part of the, I, I see what you mean. You know what? And so you, what you would probably like is um, in Catholicism, there was a big debate on this and it was yeah. between Molinists and okay. um, Dominicans. Okay. I, I remember those words before. I, I've, I've had conversations about these words and, remember, and knew what they meant, but it's not common vernacular for me anymore. What is Molinism? Oh man! Oh boy! Oh boy! You know what? That's gonna have to be a be, okay. There's like five different views of predestination okay, within okay. Uh, Catholicism, and all of them are acceptable. But none of them, again, what basically the church said was, you guys have to stop arguing about this. You're both right on certain things, but this is such a great mystery. Like what we're telling you to do is stop arguing. None, neither of you are in heresy, but this is a great mystery and. One line I really like from G.K. Chesterton is who I highly recommend. He said that Calvinists are Catholics that are obsessed with God's sovereignty. Hmm. They're just obsessed with God's sovereignty. Yeah. They want to figure it out. But Catholics say we can't figure it out, not right. fully. And see, the problem is they they feel that Catholics go uh, Calvinists go too far. And they say like, well, I know it's 100% God, so then that means it's 0% me. When Catholics say, no, it's 100% God and 100% you. Right. Kind of like the incarnation. Right. Like, yes, God is 100%. It's his grace. Like, without him, you can do anything. But at the right. same time, you're fully active and you have to cooperate. You're I, not I, I like putting it in, in terms of the 100% thing because that really calls back to like, okay, in this tradition of Christianity, we're going to make some, some claims of, 
of 200% things, and you're just going to have to right. <laughs> try to deal with that. So that's how Catholics deal with predestination, which I think is an even greater mystery in a lot of ways, or it definitely hits us closer to heart because it's like, that's my eternal destiny, right? Yeah. And it really trips us out with time and like the future and every contingent future and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, like God, like we're talking about God here. Like you think you can wrap your mind around every contingent future and every free will act of every human being that ever lived and how God works that into his master plan. There's no way anybody's going to fit that into their brain. Nobody. Yeah. So, so that's why, um, what's good is Catholicism says you do have free will. So that's a dog, like in the Catholic church, you do have free will. Yeah. You can reject. Okay. So like you can say yes, you can say no. Now, um, do you need God's grace? Yeah. You do not do it on your own. Okay. So it's not some works thing where it's like, Hey, cause that's called Pelagianism. And even semi-Pelagianism was, uh, um, rejected by the church. They said that's heresy where it's like, I can do it on my own. If I muster up enough willpower, then right. maybe I can earn heaven by my own good deeds. And the Catholic church said, Nope. Right there's no, how could you be on God level? Like God could ever owe you any, anything. Right. So they said, no, that's not true. You need God's grace. You need his forgiveness. You could never be on a level where God like owes you heaven. Right. Um, but well, that's, that's, I think when you, when you preach salvation or preach Christianity as this sort of transactional thing of like, well, if you pray this prayer that you get this, then you right. get this, you get heaven, you get eternal life. You just gotta, you pay this prayer and then uh, we'll, we'll give you this, this little card that says you get to go to heaven. I feel like yeah, I, I was yeah. reading that, that to some extent, even uh, Billy Graham, who I'm sure did like his, his who Catholics work. really like, by the way. Yeah, like I, I'm, sure, I'm sure that the works that he did are, are a net positive. But one negative thing that he may have done is, is overemphasizing this sort of numbers system of trying mm -hmm. to like, figure out how many souls saved at an event because then it becomes right. this idea of becoming a christian is just praying a prayer when you've done that we've we've reached the yeah. threshold of now you're a christian and we've got it that's all i need well, just need those numbers like, what's the point of church at least from an evangelical point of view it's like why are we shepherding these people that we know are going to heaven why don't we just yeah. go out and try exactly. to save as many exactly. souls as possible why are we all meeting when in catholicism it's like Man, I got a lot, like, I'm not some perfect person. I got right. a lot of, a lot of stuff to work on. It's working on. it out. And I still make huge, you know, huge mistakes. Hey, Evan, did and, you, did uh, you figure out, did you find that? For a uh, mass? Yeah. What, what, what does the word mean? It means to send out. Oh, okay. Oh, cool. That's, is, is it Latin originally? Yeah, or? it's a Latin word originally. Okay. Well, at least I had that. Yeah, well, at the end of mass, they say, you know, to, to basically go out and like, what we just experienced in here, like hopefully now we're charged up and now you take that out to the world. Right. Right. So it's like a, it's like a recharge. It's like, uh, it's a banquet. Hmm. It's like a family, like every week family gets together. We're going to pray together. Is, we're going to okay. have a liturgy of the word. And then we are going to eat the body and blood of Christ. Okay, I was going to ask, and, so is, is communion, is that something that's just like an every week practice? Yeah, it's actually every day because every day. you can go to mass every day. Oh wow! Want. So that I mean, within like priests still say the mass during COVID. You just can't go to it, but they perform it privately. Okay. Well, perform is the wrong word. Celebrate. Yeah. yeah. And then will will, will they uh, are they even doing like the Zoom thing where like you can you can you can watch this and you can yep. at home take yep. take the mass? Okay. Yep, they're at their house and they're saying the mass and you can watch if you'd like. That's cool. So, because I mean, they still they have to they have to. Right. Why, why is as, there a sense a priest, of like, we to have to, like, is it, is something going to be broken if they don't? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're, uh, priests are make vows. They're, they're hmm. bound by their conscience when they make that commitment. Hmm. It would be like a priest in the old Testament, not offering sacrifices on behalf of the Israelites. Like, it's like, what are you doing? You're a priest. Your job is to offer sacrifice on behalf of the people. Yeah. And that's what a priest does along with a lot of other things. But it's not just teaching people, right? It's praying for like a parish priest, all the people at his parish, right? He's responsible for shepherding them, hearing confessions, um, all, all sorts of things, baptisms and, and like, okay, how do I put it? 
Uh, you know how, okay, this is what I like. Pretty much well, a lot of Jesus parables are plant-based. Yeah, okay. Plants are not like light switches. They're not transactional. They're there living okay. things that can grow. Well, that grow, but then can stop growing. They can also become sickly and start to die, but then they can be revived again. And yeah. they also sometimes need some pruning and then weeds can come and choke them out. But then we could clear that up and re repurpose the soil and kind of, okay, rework this here. And right. now, okay, it's really a process. Fruit. It's an ongoing process. It's not just some static thing like, oh, got a plant done. Yeah. So that's how we see the Christian life. Okay, so like if Martin Luther says, okay, I'm like a piece of poo and Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is like snow that covers me. Right? You know right. that analogy? Yeah, yeah. I think, oh, I think he's a bit more vulgar than, than I am. <laughs> but like, yeah, like apparently, you know, according to Martin Luther, I'm a big piece of dung and Christ's sacrifice is a blanket of snow. So I'm still a piece of dung, but, but God sees covered me up. as clean. But Catholics have a big problem with that. Yeah, like, that, <laughs> that means you're not actually clean. Yeah. You're just poo covered in snow. How's that good? How's that getting to heaven? Right. Catholics say, okay, let's go with your dung analogy. We don't really like that, but let's go with it. Okay. Because we see, we know what you mean. They'll say, no, no, God flattens out that dung and plants a seed and a, a plant grows out of it. Right. That's so which Catholic would still be taking the essence of all the, the food and, and the energy that's in that yeah, so he can redeem that piece of poo and have something beautiful grow out of it. And that's right. what goes to heaven. But if at any point you choke out that plant, like, yeah. the, like the parable of the, uh, you know, the yeah. seeds. Yeah, the seeds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, think about that. Like, But I, I, I think that's a cool analogy because it's not even that the plant is something that's utterly distinctly separate from what it's feeding from. It's like that all the atoms that were that crap are literally becoming yeah. something else. But that's what God does. He transforms us. So what Catholics say is, no, you actually become righteous. God right. infuses his righteousness into you so it actually renovates your soul. Right. Not, well, you're a lost cause, but because you prayed a prayer, now his righteousness, you just, you know, forensically get covering you. Yeah. And so it's this false, it's it's this like um, alien righteousness that... it. It's like tricking God into getting you into heaven because he sees Jesus, even though Jesus hasn't really sunken in. Right. And Catholics have a really, well, obviously they have a problem with it because they told Martin Luther that that's problematic. Although there was lots of things that he said that they were like, yeah, we're good with that. But they just, he went, he went too far on some stuff. Yeah. You know? So, and now the thing is when I talk to most Protestants, most of them actually like the Catholic understanding. They're like, but I actually kind of see it like a plant. Yeah. Like, I do think I'm growing with God. Yeah. Well, see, so I, I think it's, it's that whenever a system or a club or a company or a country gets too rigidly uh, focused on its way of doing things, that it's yeah. not able to make some updates, eventually there builds up enough pressure of people being frustrated with not any movement that they, you know, they start a counter movement. But then the counter movement ends up being so focused on moving Yes. That is not anchored to anything. Yeah, see, and that's, oh my goodness. Yeah. And that's the thing is a lot of things in Protestantism are rejections to stuff. And they're, right. they're super, they're super focused on one thing. And that's what their identity is based on. Yeah. Right. And but you it, can't and have an identity thing. based on rejection. That like, that's not an identity. That's not, <laughs> right. that's like the, the only useful thing you can do with starting a club based on not liking another club is just breaking down that club. Like, right. I mean, you well, can at least that, build yeah. up uh, if there's enough people that are frustrated with, with the way they've been treated in that other community, you can at least get some people together who want to be around, but you're just going to sit there and talk about how much you hated that place you used to be. Yeah. And so the, okay, how do I put like the Christian life is an ongoing thing in Hebrews. They talk about the Christian life, like a race. Yeah. Well, a race you start, but you then also run. And if it's a marathon, which is more of the like the idea of the Christian life is, yeah. okay, I got, God wants me to run a marathon. I don't know how long it's going to be. That's up to God. But while I'm on this earth, he has a plan and purpose for me. And it's not just preaching the gospel, right? It's right. I have to grow in holiness. I have to grow in virtue. I need to grow in, like, actually the primary vocation for a Catholic is to grow in relationship with God. Right. If I am not doing that, then how am I even going to be able to evangelize my neighbor? 
Right. Right. Just because I know a lot of, like I go to a Bible study and have some facts, that doesn't mean I'm going to be any good at witnessing to somebody. If anything, they're probably just going to be annoyed by me. Right. Because I'm not, I'm just trying to like win them by debate or just point out flaws in their life and tell them that they need Christ. And it's like, how about you get to know the person? Right. How about you like show them some love before you start just like randomly talking about like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. When, so, when, it, when it becomes about a transaction of getting them to, to sign their name on the check that says that they believe this prayer. It's like, yeah. Like give them a tract. Like yeah. that's not, um, the, the, anyway. So, so could, you, would you say like I, a identifiable difference between Catholicism and evangelicalism is that there's a more of a focus on being something and being a community. Well, I think there's great community in the Protestant world. Like, oh, for, for sure. It, I'm not trying to say to, to, to knock that and say that like Protestants are, are like, I mean, obviously Protestantism as a tradition and, and all of the denominations that have sprung up under that yeah. would, wouldn't still be around if they weren't working and if we weren't getting a lot of things right. Um, right. But like, it, it, exactly. Do you see, yeah. do you see something stronger there though in Catholicism, where it's like there's more of a sense of community or more of a sense of like church is about being a collection of people? Uh, yeah, n not necessarily. Because uh, to be honest, in in certain evangelical uh, churches, uh, you would probably get a much warmer feeling there. Mm, okay. Right, like the greeters and all the different things they have available, and the coffee and donuts right, afterwards, right, right. and. So I mean that's that's they just might be awesome. even more like, focused on like the on the micro community, whereas I, I yeah. guess maybe when I look at Catholicism, I think it, it, it's more about like there's a sense of the Catholic Church has a pope, and it's like oh well, we're then, a big then, yeah, thing. Yeah, you, you can't be beat be, because yeah, like there's definitely like it's world, it's global. Well, Catholic means universal. Yeah. So it's definitely different. It's not just oh okay, my church is down the street and that's my group. Right. That's just like, it's almost like that's just a franchise. Like that's just a yeah. parish. That's not church, right? The, I'm, I'm a part of the church and this is a parish, but that's within a diocese and that's within a, like the church is, <laughs> the church universal is so much bigger, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so it's also very humbling too, because, you know, a Protestant pastor who kind of feels like on top of the world, like, okay, I've got my doctorate and, you know, I'm the head of this church and I, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, if he were to come into Catholicism, now he's just a lay person. Right. Right. Like yeah. he's a lay, he's not a priest. He's not a bishop. He's not part of the, you know, right. teaching magisterium. So like he has no jurisdiction. He is, do you know what I'm saying? Like, and it's not yeah. like, oh, just cause I have a doctorate, I should be ordained. Right. It's like, no, God's got to call you to that. You have to discern that. Yeah. So what a lot of Protestant pastors who become Catholic do, they wind up becoming um, like professors or catechists, or they become speakers or scholars or, right? But then okay. they're going to mass like everybody else. That doesn't mean that they're going to be a priest. Right. So there's a lot more uniformity than in, in that circle of like, well, I, you just said a bunch of words that I don't, don't exactly know what they mean, like a magisterium of teachers, you said? Oh, the teaching magisterium, that, that's like the official teaching of the church. Like okay. if all the if all the bishops get together and uh and they say something that the whole church is to to believe, um, then as a Catholic I'm bound by conscience that So in every in every it would congregation be right to say that in every Catholic congregation is there a set of like, okay, these are the positions that are gonna be filled. There's gonna be a this guy, there's gonna be a priest, there's gonna be a like, well, <laughs> tell me a little bit about that. What's, what's the, the oh. template that you have to fill to be a Catholic church or a Catholic congregation? Oh, oh I don't know if I understand the question right. Well, uh, so like, cause here's the thing. I'm not like, I'm not a priest. I'm not a bishop. So yeah, I, yeah, I don't yeah. know like church government stuff like that. That's okay. almost like asking me administrative questions. It's well, like, I'm focused on growing close to God and, and doing what I'm supposed to do in my role. That's okay. sort of a technical, I mean, I can give you the yeah. little I know. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, like, you need a, you need what, a priest, what does a regular Catholic a know about this? Like, because <laughs> I guess yeah, in Protestantism, it's like, hey, if I know the Bible really well and I want to start a church, I can do that. Yeah. I mean, I mean or it's at least a lot easier to get sort of ordained or or, or some sort of accreditation from from whoever. Yeah, you, you like, basically, you go to school, and um, I mean, you can kind of get ordained in the mail. Yeah. Even. Yep. That doesn't happen in Catholicism. It's a sacrament. It has to be discerned. Okay. And they can actually tell you like, nope. 
Yeah, it's like they, we just don't feel that this is right for you. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Yeah, because just because you think you'd make a good priest, right, <laughs> doesn't mean like that. That's, that's, that's is actually really God's will. Right. And maybe, maybe you are called to be a teacher or maybe you're going to be a deacon or maybe you can help out in youth ministry or maybe, or maybe you are called to the priesthood. Yeah. But like, that's the thing is that's also like a lifelong commitment. Like there's also like, there's, it's a completely different thing than, than being a Protestant pastor. It's very, very different. Mm -hmm. It's very different. Um, Okay, but as far as the question about the template of the of a Catholic congregation, like at a building where mass is going to be held, right. what so that's positions called, are going to be filled? So, okay, there's going to be a parish. So at a parish, yep. what yep. positions are going to be filled? There's going to be there's going to be the people that are, that are attending. There's going to be some guy who's leading things. Who is that? A priest? Okay, yeah, the priest. You need a priest to say mass. Without a priest, you can't say mass. So you need a priest. You need a congregation. Yep. Is that is that the only necessary elements? Uh, are we just saying like you want to go to mass? I'm. I don't know. I'm just kind of wondering, like, because within the, yeah, the I different would say churches I've been minimum, to, you need a you need a priest, um, but you also need bread and wine. If you don't have bread and wine, we can't okay. say mass. Okay. So, so that's a fundamental okay. part of things too. Why is that so is central? We need a space. We need an altar because you have to have your sacrifice on an altar. Okay. And you need bread and wine because that's what Jesus told us to use. If you don't have bread and wine, you don't have the right elements in order okay. for them to trend you know, to uh, transform. Oh, okay. Here's, here's a good question. If, if we want to have a, a, a brief debate or something um, okay. with, with taking mass and with, with taking the bread and wine, this is a, probably a straw man I've heard in charismatic circles that like okay. that Catholics, you know, they believe it literally becomes the, the flesh and blood of Christ. And like yeah. that, yeah. that sounds very funny to us. I know it sounds funny. Uh, yeah, we believe that. So, so what, can you give me maybe a, a, I don't know, like. Sure. Like, I, I guess when I heard that, I thought, okay, well, so could you just well, here, really like, silly questions. The, could, could you like, the gospels, could you stop somebody gospels. in the middle of it? And like, it's literally, you, you had, you found the DNA of that, like halfway, well, okay. halfway down in your stomach. Could you pull that out? And that's, that's now Jesus' oh, okay. DNA. Okay, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. It's not quite. That's like the that. question. Okay. okay. So is it oh, more oh, symbolic or, or what is it? Like, what's going on? Okay. So we do believe it's the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. Okay. Okay. The way St. Thomas tried to explain what is a mystery. Okay. So remember, we are dealing with mystery here. So it's not like we're going to fully get it. Okay. All right. So like if you believe in the incarnation or you believe in the Trinity, you're well aware that there are things called mysteries. We're going to end up with a mathematical equation that doesn't add up here again. Uh, that we can't fully solve, but perhaps in eternity, God will give okay. us the grace to like understand it. We're going to okay. discover there are 200% things. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Jesus took bread and wine and he said, this is my body. Okay. Right. And from the very beginning, the earliest Christian documents that you will ever find unanimously held that it's a sacrifice and it is the literal body and blood of Christ. Okay. Th that would maybe be the, the word I would want to take issue with it is it, it's literally the body. I mean, because. So here's what, here's what, uh. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas says, he calls it transubstantiation. So in Aristotle's metaphysics, you have what's called um, uh, substance and accidents. So okay. the substance, and again, I am not an Aristotelian philosopher, so I'm a layman. Okay. I'm doing my best. Okay. You've got accidents. That's like the stuff that you can touch. Okay. Okay. Uh, like, like, let's say you have a, a ball. Yeah. So the accidents would be like the rubber it's made of and the color that it is. Yeah. Right. Could it be made of plastic? Sure. It'd still be a ball. Uh, could it be an orange ball instead of a blue ball? Sure. So the accidents can change, but the substance is like the actual form. Okay. Right. Like, like that, what that makes it, it a ball? It's ballness. Yeah. That it's a sphere. And okay. that's something that's actually like invisible. It's a metaphysical. Right. It's an idea. Like in your mind, you understand what a ball is. Okay. Yeah. 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 But when you see it and touch it, that's all the accidents. That's accidents. like, well, the okay. rubber and the, but you need it to be round. Like the moment that, um, like if you were to melt it, it's no longer a ball. Right. Now this, it's actually changed. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, it no longer now has that form. Right. So, uh, yeah. Um, so anyway, We've got bread and wine. What's different about this is the accidents don't change. 
but the substance does. And that usually doesn't happen. Usually but, we but we're not talking about morphology and... anymore, though. It's not that, like, the shape of it... Like, we, we identify a ball by its shape, right? Right, right. But being, uh, you know, bread and wine becoming the body and blood of Christ. Uh, yeah, obviously, so still, I mean... If you looked under a microscope, you would not see DNA. You right. would see... It bread tastes like bread. It smells like bread. It digests like bread. Under a microscope, you're seeing bread molecules. Right. The claim is a metaphysical one. Okay. That underneath that, in a in a deeper reality, is it, the it, substance has has changed. Is it sort of in the same sense of like uh, it says like you know where two or three are gathered, I am there. It's like okay, we literally yeah. believe that that God is there, but like but you're that, not going I mean, to find Jesus Christ's DNA somewhere hidden in that room suddenly. Um, I would say that transubstantiation is different. Like there's similarities there, but uh, it's not. It's it is Jesus' body and blood, but the accidents are unchanged. And so, um, but but the substance it is the so so you would like. Yeah, so I, what, I, I what's an identifiable? Sense. Like I mean, I, I, the analogy was helpful, but like why? Well, why, why would it be wrong to say that, that that every that, mass is a miracle? That well, a miraculous, and it's like the we're basically at the last. It's like the Last Supper again. Okay. But so, I, I, why would it be wrong to say that that um, you know, it becoming Christ's body and blood is a metaphor? Oh well, because he didn't say it was a metaphor. Well, but what what Jesus said tells parables. He doesn't necessarily say that they're parables either. True, yeah, but I mean, again, you have to look at the context. But like when Jesus said, "I am the door," no one was like, "Well, where are your hinges?" Well, I mean, maybe, maybe in substance, he's saying that he is literally a door. He's like in, a, in experientially, right. if you walk through him, walk through his way of life, right. that's literally going to bring you to a different place. I mean, so the best thing would be like John six. So context, but then also church fathers, like the tradition of the church. Yeah. If all of the church fathers are unanimous on this actually being a sacrifice, and it really is the body and blood of Christ that can be worshipped, well, see, then I think the problem is just is confusing the word "really" and the word "literally." Like, just because oh. you know it really is the body and blood of Christ doesn't necessarily also have to mean it literally is the body and blood of Christ. Because I think when we think about literal, yeah, what do you? Okay, yeah, define your term then. What do you mean by by literal? I, I well. I mean, I was trying to think well, about what, what I mean, I mean is about it's it. not just a symbol. Like, we're talking about some serious stuff here. Like, for Catholics... Well, when I listened to this guy, whole... Jonathan Peugeot, he would say that symbols literally are what they represent. It's not that they, they, they just represent it. It's like they are literally... And it's like, I guess, so then what do you mean by yeah, literal? It's not, it, it is a symbol, but it's more than that. Because obviously, like... There are some things that are just symbols. They represent something. So, so like, they're for, meaningful, for... But, but it ends there. But sacraments are different. They are symbols, but they also um, affect what they symbolize. So does water clean you? Yeah. So is that a great symbol for washing away sin? Yeah. But guess what? It also actually does that spiritually. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit really does something at that baptism. It's not just a symbol of what happened previously. God is actually doing something through that. So okay. you know what? Here's a great... I think this will really hit the nail on the head. There was a... Um, like in the Gospels, Jesus heals people in many different ways. Yeah. There's a blind man. Jesus could just be like, zap him and say, see. No, still there. He's still saying something, right? Yeah. So there's, you're like, why does he even have to lay his hand? Like, is the power going through his hand, out his fingertips? Into, okay. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he tells the blind man, put dirt on your eyes and go wash it. After he does that, then he can see. If he didn't do that, it wouldn't have happened. Why is God working through this physical thing? Why is he working through mud and water? Like, what about the woman who reaches out to grab his cloak? Like, right. if I could just reach the hem of his garment, and Jesus says, I felt power go out through me, and she was healed. Mm -hmm. There's all sorts of times where there's something, or like uh, in the Old Testament, Naaman has leprosy, and he goes and says he wants to be healed. Then he says, okay, go in the river and dip seven times. And at first he wasn't going to do it. He's like, this is stupid. Why don't you just heal me? Like, and why seven? Yeah. And why am I going in a river? And then his helpers were like, you know what? Why don't you just try it? Why don't you just do mm -hmm. what he said? Because like, if it works, that'd be, 
And so he does, if he only did it six times, it wouldn't have worked. Like why dip seven times? I don't know. Let's just be obedient and do it. And then he was healed. Yeah. And so what God is not bound by the sacraments. He doesn't have to act through them, but he chose to. It's fitting because we're material beings. So he chose to have instruments of his grace because it's fitting for us. We're stuck in time. We're stuck in a physical reality. So he's given us physical. geographical things that are in time and space that are channels of his grace to us. And he's not bound by them. He can act outside of them whenever he wants to. Right. But I don't want to ignore them. If they're gifts for me, I'm going to make use of them. I'm going to go like, okay. So the, um, so the sacraments are a really big deal. They are, um, gifts from Christ to us. They're, they're channels of grace. They're like moments in my life that I can, I can actually grab onto. And I say, I know concretely that this event happened. I could touch it and see it and experience it. And by faith, I know that God was at work through it, that he gave me something that I could feel so that it's not just all in my mind. Because right. a lot of stuff in Protestantism is you're basically just worshiping God with your mind. Everything is just intellect. It's, well, I believe this and I know this Well, fact. I mean, when, when you get into the more charismatic circles, it becomes not very much about See, that either. It becomes the, like just totally about this, this Holy Spirit experience. Well, and that's the thing is a, a, a lot of charismatics are a lot closer to Catholicism with the idea of like putting oil on people. Sure, and, okay. Uh, like... Like Catholics have holy water, we have blessed salt, we have oil, we have bells and candles and incense. And and why? It's because, well, because God has told us to use these things and gave these things to us and we're human, right? We're yeah. not angels, we have bodies, Yeah. right? Like, why do I have to eat? You know, like, couldn't have God made it that we're just like self-sustaining creatures that don't have to eat? But well, I've got to eat, like... And so it's the same, like the sacraments are for my spiritual well-being. They're physical um, gifts that also, like God works in and through them. No, the thing is my heart has to be open to it, right? So it's not like, oh, I received the Eucharist, uh, but my heart is totally opposed to God. And now I've received this magical grace. In Catholicism, they go, you only receive the Eucharist if like you're in, in a right state. You know what I mean? That's why St. Paul said, you better examine yourself before you partake in the body, blood, and Christ. And that's why he said it was so serious that some had fallen asleep because they weren't taking it serious because they didn't discern the body of the Lord. Um, and John 6 is a big deal. In John 6, Jesus says, you know, like, I am the bread, you know, that fell from heaven, right? And he said, truly, I tell you that my flesh is real food, you know, and my blood is real drink. And then they object to it, right? They're like, what do you mean? How's he going to give us his flesh to eat? So they were taking him literally. Yeah. And he didn't say, oh, no, guys, it's a metaphor. You took me all wrong. He actually continues. Do you know what I mean? He doesn't correct them and say, no, you're, you're missing the point. Yeah. And in any of his other talks, like when he says, I am the vine, no one's going like, what do you mean you're a vine? I don't see any leaves. What, what is this nonsense? But when he's saying that my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink, lots of people have a problem with it. And he doesn't say, no, you're misunderstanding. If anything, a lot of them leave because they're like, this is a hard teaching. Who can take it? Yeah. And uh, then he turns to his own apostles and says, are you going to leave me too? Yeah. And see, Peter doesn't say, I understand what you're saying. He just says like, you have the words of eternal life. Where else are we going to go? Right. He didn't fully grasp it either. They didn't... I mean, then you got to go to Holy Thursday, the Last Supper, where he takes the bread. And here's the thing. They're eating the Passover meal. And what happened in Passover? If you go back to Exodus, they had to kill a lamb, put its blood on the doorpost, and then eat the lamb. You have to eat the sacrifice, right? So on Holy Thursday, Jesus takes the, the Passover bread, but then he breaks from the regular Jewish liturgy, and he says something that it was never said before. He says, this is my body. And they probably would have been shocked, like, uh, that's not what we usually say. <laughs> right. Right. And so he's saying, this is my body, but then it connects to Good Friday, right? Where he's crucified on the cross. And so now what happened on Holy Thursday and what happens on Good Friday are connected. That his execution outside of the temple, right, is now corresponding with the Jewish 
liturgy of, of the sacrificial meal, right? That's why he said what he said, like, this is my body. And so, and then he said, do this in memory of me. So that's why Christians from the very beginning, from the apostles, it's basically, it's not church unless you have the Eucharist, because that's like the, that's what everything's leading towards is the sacrifice on the cross that is connected. That is the Eucharist. And I eat the sacrifice and it, you are what you eat, right? You know, you eat, you nourish. So it nourishes your soul. So I can become like Christ, not like I'm a cannibal, not something weird like that, like in an unbloody way. But you know what I mean? Like, like, uh, that Jesus loves me so much that he gave me his body so that I could consume it. And then he like that with, with my heart being right, of course, because I have to cooperate with the grace. He's going to transform me and help me to continue to grow, to be like him. And just like you eat to get stronger as a baby, I eat the Eucharist as a Catholic, along with many other things uh, like prayer and reading scripture and all sorts of things. Um, to, to grow in my relationship with God, you know? You said you are what you eat. And obviously that's, I mean, that term relates pretty particularly to like, physically you are what you eat. But when you're saying that the sacrament doesn't physically become Jesus Christ's body and it's blood, It substantially becomes though. Right. But so all these other related ways of talking about it, saying that like you are what you eat, it's like it, it doesn't, it doesn't quite well, translate for me because it's it's. Well, again, I'm not saying if you eat Kellogg's Frosted Flakes that you become Frosted Flakes. Or you well, but you Tony do, you you do become the sugar, and and like that becomes part of you. It yes. So and I do believe that. Well, I'm. I don't all Christians believe that Christ becomes like a part of us. Like the Jesus is in my heart now. But. I, I right? guess the what Holy I'm still Spirit asking is how, me. how is, so like when, when I read that verse or hear people say, you know, when Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, it's like, that's right. even more so what I'm focusing on. I'm like, okay, I'm doing this and this is supposed to be a reminder of, of oh, yeah, Jesus of Christ. But like, yes. <sighs> well, because he died 2000 years ago and this reminds me of that, but now I'm also participating in it. I didn't get, I wasn't born back then to see it, right? but I get to go to mass and see it in a sacramental way. But I mean, w when we do the nativity around Christmas, like we're, right. we're participating in the incarnation, but we're not like, I don't, I don't, I don't think most Christians well, would yeah, make the well, same statement Jesus about, you know, that baby literally becomes yeah. Jesus Christ. And that woman who's acting as Mary literally becomes Mary. No, but that's because Jesus didn't institute that as a sacrament. Okay. Right? Like, we're just going with what Jesus said. Like, Jesus did establish baptism, right? right? We didn't make that up. The church just didn't make that up. He said, you know, unless you're born of water and spirit, then you don't enter the kingdom of heaven, mm -hmm. right? And uh, St. Paul call, calls it the, the washing of regeneration, right? I think that's in, mm -hmm. uh, is it, um, oh, man. I, 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 know, I know that verse too, but I, I don't know where it's found. Man, I, I'm uh, my reference. I think it are, might be in in, right in John. Well, I think Mark sixteen sixteen. Jesus says, "He who believes and is baptized will be saved." Right? Okay. Like it, yeah. they're always going together. Like baptism is a big deal. I think it was um, uh, Titus three five. Oh, that's it. Yeah, yeah. And the washing of regeneration. My mom yes. freaking taught me all these <laughs> all these like rhymes or like or turned I think every it's verse into a song. Peter. Where oh, St. Peter actually goes right out there and says that baptism now saves you. Right. Okay. I had never seen that verse as a Protestant ever in my life. Hmm. I'd never seen that verse. No. And by the way, I also looked at the church I was a worship leader at. I looked at their, uh, their baptism class. Yeah. That verse was not in there. Hmm. I was shocked that the verses that Catholics use for baptism were purposely avoided. Hmm. Because it would make one think if they read that they're like, wait, baptism seems to be more than a symbol in this passage. Right. right. It's like, we just, well, let's just not deal with that because that doesn't flow with our theology that's only 100 years old anyway. Yeah. It's like, man, you're ignoring 2,000 years of church history. Yeah. You're, you're ignoring what the church fathers held unanimously and wrote explicitly but about. So as, as a Catholic, it's more, well, this is really doing something, but I can't yes. explain exactly 
it's not something that you're going to understand. It's a mystery what's going on. But like it's basically at least you want to get people to the point uh, where it's at least this is important. Well, how would you, ex let's say there was a Muslim who's but, like, you know what? I'm kind of like not so opposed to Christianity anymore, but they're like, I'm having a hard time with the Trinity. Can you explain that to me? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're only going to be able to get so far. Mm -hmm. It's only, and it's, the thing is like, don't get too concerned because it's it's God's grace that's going to bring them there, mm -hmm. right? You do the best you can and you pray for them, but it's God that's at work in their heart and he can give them the grace to get over that intellectual obstacle. You know yeah. what I mean? So, uh, su surprisingly then to me, it, it seems that like, that these smaller traditions and these younger traditions have a, are a lot more, um, are a lot more rigid actually in their in their theology of like okay this is the way it is and we have a clear understanding of what the trinity means and yes. all these things like that. and there's sort of a derogatory way of calling things you know metaphorical and, and using that as a way of saying that, that it's not really anything like that baptism isn't really anything and that and that taking uh you know communion isn't isn't it's just all symbolic it doesn't like when i think about the word yeah. symbolic or metaphorical it's like that that doesn't seem just because the way I think about those words, like I don't, I don't mean anything negative by that, or and like I don't even mean that, that that's not really no. nothing's really happening. Like, yeah, I I feel like I could even describe like what you're saying that that still almost fits with my understanding of what metaphor <laughs> or symbolism might might mean. Hmm. But that's probably yeah. just because I have a kind of a weird view <laughs> of those words. Right. Well, hey, who knows? Maybe you kind of do have a quasi sacramental view already. Right. Right. I don't know. Uh, and that's like, I think you're at least growing up for me, I just saw communion as, okay, this is a Ritz cracker. Cause I even see the kitchen it comes from. Yeah. And I know this is yeah, the yeah, Welch's yeah. grape juice from the kitchen in the back. And I wasn't worried if a little bit spilt or if some crumbs went on the carpet. And, and at the end, like a lot of people, like, like Catholics would be shocked seeing how like just casually things are held or how they just put the grape or pour it back in and put it in the fridge. Like the, we don't even, again, it's, it's just very different that, um, mm. this, okay, this that, is so all those sacred. little details sound very interesting to be like, I, I wouldn't have thought about those. Like the, so, so when, you, when somebody in the Catholic church in a, in a parish is administering communion, it's like, yeah, I have to be careful with this wine and like none of it, like what about the leftovers? Yeah. Is it saved for the next time? Is it poured no, out in it. a special no, place? All, no, no, no. You drink it all. Okay. And then you put water in there yep. and then you drink that too. Okay. And then you, you, Cause like, you don't want to miss thing. out on any of that. Well, you don't want to disrespect the body of Christ. Hmm. Right. Like you don't, what are you going to just now drop that on the floor? Right. Like th this is Jesus. Okay. Is the one who so saves now I'm seeing the, the big difference between treating it like, symbol versus treating it like it's really doing something yeah well okay okay uh how do i put catholics and orthodox and yeah. then i would say uh, probably some anglicans and may maybe some depending on the lutheran yeah. but catholics definitely at least they're supposed to <laughs> believe that jesus is truly present in the eucharist not just in some spiritual thing like oh he's here with us it's like no no, no. Um, what you're holding in your hand right now, that's Jesus. And y like eat the, well, it's called the host. Eat yeah. the host. Um, that's what you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to do. Well, also, uh, sometimes they'll take the host and put in what's called a monstrance, a monstrance and have adoration. Okay. So that's where we can see Jesus in the, in the blessed sacrament, in the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can be there for an hour and just in his presence. And so a lot of priests will have, uh, an hour of adoration every day. Hmm. So they'll kneel before Christ in the sacrament, maybe read scripture, pray, or just kind of just be quiet and kind of just hang out. Hmm. And it's beautiful. I've got, I used to go to adoration once a month on Fridays and I would lead music. Mm -hmm. I would sing actually a lot of times, like your typical, like uh, Protestant songs, hmm. um, Okay, that, that was actually one of the last things I wanted to ask you about. We should probably wrap things up pretty soon. I don't want to take up we, your time. You know what? Day. We need to talk again, though. Yeah. <laughs> we definitely need to talk. I, I, like, this is beautiful. I'm, I'm definitely enjoying I feel like there's, there's so, like, so many times we've, we've jumped back on to try and stay on track here, but yeah. there's a lot of, of little conversations uh, I'd love to have with we've you. We've totally, and we're scratching but, the surface, man. Like, I feel bad because I have so much I want to say, but at the same time, I know we're limited in time. But, but it's okay. Let me, let me ask you real quick, though. 
uh, about music because okay. I I really don't love the music in um, <laughs> I do not love CCM at all. That that whole yeah, the you. whole branding of of Christian music right now is not yes not interesting to me, and it's it kind yep. of makes me. I just like I, I think about the idea of what music can be, and I see even right. historically what the church even has done with music, and some of the amazing things that have happened th- with the church being the driving engine behind some great musical works that were made, and then I yep. see this. M- maybe it's just too much of a marriage to to the the principles of capitalism, like just trying to sell yeah. Christian music. Maybe, maybe that's the problem, but it's just like. The kinds think, yeah. of stuff that's being pumped out right now, and it's, I, I don't want to like rat on anybody who's trying to like, especially these people who are really trying to like live out their faith yeah. in a sincere way. It's just like something about the template they've been handed for what Christian music is. I think yes. is deeply flawed. <laughs> oh, I yeah, I understand. I think a lot of it is like that. There's some Christian music, like the the typical, like the Chris Tomlin type stuff that you're yeah. talking about. That. There's the odd song where I'll be like, uh, like there's a Matt Marr song called uh, "Run to the Father" that I really like. Okay. Um, like, I, yeah, I, I, there's some I can pick and choose and see. Like, okay, this yeah. this is some pretty good stuff. Even like, but yeah, there's a lot of just like carbon copy, run of the mill, same four chords. Like, and I don't want to made a video that a while ago. Yeah, yeah, kinda, exactly. Like, parroting that, and you, you, yeah, you totally, uh, like that was great because you're basically like, here's your four chords, one, five, six, four. Right. Uh, we need this, that, and the other. And I think what's his name? The oh, he he was pretty popular for a while. Uh, yeah. He was a Christian comedian. Yep. Oh my goodness, what's oh, his name? Well, are you talking about the Messy Mondays guys, like Jordan uh, Jordan Taylor? Or are you talking about no, Derek Webb? No, he was from the he was from the states. He had like a couple viral. Oh, videos John about, Christ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. John yeah. Christ. He he also did something that that like okay. Christian um, record labels. Okay. Yeah, I think right I saw about, that like, too. How, yeah, how to yeah, write yeah. a Christian hit. Yeah. And so like there's a lot of truth to that and that's unfortunate. Well, so I uh, want to ask you is there is there any freedom from that is is there is the catholic uh experience with music any better or are you suffering from the same same drought well, there's of some, <laughs> There's some pretty cringy catholic music too. <laughs> yeah, well, but here's the, like and then there's some great stuff. Like there's great protestant music and then there's like not so great protestant music. There's yeah. some well, if you look at the tradition of Catholicism over 2,000 years, some of the best music you'll ever find is within the Catholic tradition. Just yep. like some of the best art you'll ever find mm-hmm. is in the Catholic tradition. And whether people are of any religion or have no religion, they will still go to Catholic cathedrals and just be in awe. Yeah. Right? And that's because there's also a philosophical difference uh, in Catholicism. Uh, God is the source of beauty, and beauty is one way to God. Yeah. So there's truth and goodness and beauty. And so in the Catholic tradition, although in, in the 70s, something went wrong, but uh, okay. in, I, I don't mean 80, 70, I mean in the 1970s, there's some really ugly looking okay. uh, buildings. But in the classical Catholic tradition, they were like, we have to make stuff like they called it sacred geometry, hmm. right? It's like mathematics and science and the way that I, like, I'm going to use my gift of architecture to honor God. I'm going to worship right. him in the way this building is designed. Yeah. And it's going to be so beautiful. Well, I mean, and there's a tradition of that right down through into the Old Testament, right? Where there's so much time spent talking about the dimensions of things and, and how like yeah. there's supposed to be agreement between, okay, when you have a temple, there's got to be this room and then this room, there has to be an inner court, an outer yes. court. There's got to be a holy place. There's gotta See, and that's be... what I mean. God is very physical. Right. Well, here's another thing too, right? Why the heck did God say to build a bronze statue with a serpent on it? And when right. you look at it, you will be healed. Yeah. That sounds wow. very Catholic. <laughs> I thought we weren't supposed to worship graven images. Yeah, yeah. yeah Doesn't yeah. that seem like a contradiction? Yeah. But well, I mean, that's even what not. I was thinking a second ago when you were saying, talking, maybe you can remind me what the word was, but like when spending time with Christ of just like looking at the, the sacrament of communion or... Or the Eucharist. It's so great. You don't what is that called again, anything. though? Sorry, you said a word for that? I think I just said hanging out. Oh, adoration. 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 Okay. Yeah. Because you adore Christ. You worship but Christ. I was thinking, like, okay, I could definitely see looking at that situation and thinking, like, oh, are you guys worshiping the Eucharist? That's that's wrong. But, like... Well, the answer should be yes. <laughs> yes, I would say, yes, I am. I'm singing songs to Christ. I'm pouring out my heart to Christ. Right. I'm asking for him to 
fill me with his love and to forgive me. And what would what would actually happen at the beginning of adoration that that we would do is uh, the priest would give a reflection. Yeah. So read from the gospel, give like a quick reflection. And then there would be confession available during that hour. So if someone's really got something on their chest, they can go to the priest and and they can say their their sins. And we can talk about confession another time. But then it's also, this is just a quiet time for you. And I'm going to sing songs that will hopefully assist you in prayer. So if you don't know what to say or your mind's distracted, here's music to help you stay focused on why right. you're here. Well, what I was going to say, though, about worshiping sort of an image or like a physical thing is it's like, okay, the, the that could be a problem if you were under the assumption that this thing is holding the entire identity of what God is. But if you can understand that God is manifesting himself through this thing, and this is this is God, but the whatever. Okay, well, how about this? Let's say Jesus was walking around physically. Like, let's say he was sitting beside you. Okay. Would you worship him as God? Yeah. But so I, I, I think to, to be, even to get to the place where you, you know, maybe overemphasize the character of, of Jesus within the Trinity, it's like, okay, you're missing out on part of, on, on, the fullness of God because you've become so obsessed with Jesus. Uh, well, uh, Hmm. I don't, sorry. What do you mean? So I, I mean like, so even like we were talking a second ago about this, this statue of bronze and the serpent and stuff and worshiping right. that it's like, okay, God is present there. And, and in some sense that is God and you ought to worship it. But like, if you, if you get stuck on that thing, that, you know, graven oh, image. No, I would never like... say that the bronze statue was God. Not at all. Okay. No, no, no. That's just a bronze statue. Okay. That's not a, that's not a sacrament. That's that, that's not, uh, that is just, God just said, Hey, when you build that, if you obey me and look at it, I'm going to work through it. But that's not a sacrament. That's not actually, that's not God. God's just working through it. That's a completely different thing. That's okay. like God can work through you or work through me or work through whatever he can work through a song and work through whatever he wants to work through. But, 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 okay. But the, the, the Eucharist is something completely different because Jesus said, this is my body. This is my blood. It connects to the, so we call it the sacrifice of the mass that this is this, um, it is a, what's the, what's the proper word here? Um, a, um, we are seeing the once for all sacrifice again. Okay. We're, 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 we're seeing it. So it's almost like we're going back in time. Like Jesus did it only once. He doesn't have to keep doing it, but we need to continually offer sacrifice, right? To worship him. And so what we do is he gave us the sacrifice to offer. It's himself. And he gave us his body sacramentally to continue on forever. He is our Passover lamb that we consume. So we're no longer, you know, the Israelites eating the Passover meal we are now the New Testament, the New Covenant Passover meal is the Eucharist. It's Christ himself. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Hmm. Now I'm not killing an animal. That's okay, because I was going to ask if, if there was, if within the Catholic tradition, there's, there's a belief at all that like before the time of Christ, people who were, were taking part in the Passover, they were in some sense, or maybe in the same sense, taking part of like eating Christ like no. like the, so so we you don't believe that no, no, like it's not the same no you're eating a lamb here okay. Jesus so that was well, just like, a symbol yes okay yep yeah yeah there are yep yeah, I don't know how <laughs> okay yeah. <laughs> yeah clearly that lamb is not Jesus but when then Jesus shows up and he says I am the lamb of God uh, he, he says, I am the Lamb of God, and he says, I am the bread. I mean, the bread is me. So what, what's the difference between no, those no, no, statements? Because no. Christ is not literally a lamb. Right. That, that one is a metaphor. You're right. So, but how, not... You're saying that I have to pick this up from context. So I'm, yeah, I'm that... noticing a very mysterious and indirect way of, of speech in Christ in general. And so I don't know that the, the context is that easy to you know interpret. Je Jesus does say some pretty mysterious stuff. There are yeah. still verses no one knows exactly what was meant by that. I think that but, makes up for a good chunk of what he said. Yeah. Um, I, I think okay, we wouldn't I, still be arguing about it two 2,000 years later if, if, if the yeah. things that Christ said were very clear. Well, here, here's the thing. There really wasn't much of an argument uh, regarding the, the Eucharist. At the beginning, it was a given. It was like, sure. everybody knows that. It wasn't, it's not really until 
the Protestant uh, Reformation that there's an argument over this. And I think even though it may even be sort of a recent thing of even having a problem of, of, of like that even becoming a question, because I don't think that, I, I think when we began to develop the whole schools of science that we have now, we began yeah. to think a lot differently about reality and about yes. what literally it means. Yeah, see, people are thinking about molecules, and they're stuck right. in this like materialist uh, reductionism. Yeah, it's, it's materialism, and, and so they have a harder time thinking about you know mystery and about like well, what is virtue then, and what is right. the spiritual realm? When before people took this for granted, they're like, yeah, God's working a miracle. I don't know it, but it's Him. He told me that, and I believe it. Sort of like right. so, it's this simple faith. But then when people counter and say, well, what do you mean? See, that's the church's job is once theologians start like trying to break it down, they're like, whoa, 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 you guys are getting too far. Yeah. So it's like, uh, we've never thought about it that much, yeah. but we've always believed it to be such and such. And so, no, that's heresy, that's heresy, that's heresy. Uh, this is what the church has always taught. So a lot of times they're just blowing the whistle on theologians that are going too far because they're trying to like break it down when it's like, look, you're dealing with a mystery. Christ didn't, you know, give us a science book. He didn't. He just told us what we need for our salvation. Yeah. He, uh, you know, he's given us minds to think things out, but um, like, so I would say like, obviously these are great questions and keep, keep asking them. Uh, <laughs> and, and, but, um, and sorry if my answers aren't, aren't satisfying enough. Uh, well, it's, and uh, I, I'm appreciating to, like, your answers because I, I, I'm, I'd rather hear, what it's like to just be a normal person who 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 identifies right. as a Catholic and and what how does this how do my questions land for you? Right. Yeah. Well, and again, I'm also like it's harder for me to go back to my Protestant mindset. Yeah. And that's the thing I realized when I was more recently I was talking to my wife. I'm like, Joriel, like when I first became Catholic, I could talk Protestant really easy. Yeah. I said I'm getting rusty. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was like, oh my goodness, like I, I'm almost like forgetting that mindset. Yeah. So I actually have a harder time now trying to like bridge that gap because i i don't think that way anymore and it's, yeah. it's become much more a part of me uh okay here's okay. you know what francis chan has a great video on this i don't know if you ever watch any of his stuff but he's going through something right now too he's really questioning catholicism and stuff okay and um in catholicism the center is christ mm -hmm. there's an altar and the eucharist Everything is revolving around Christ, right? And you have the liturgy of the word. So we, we experience Christ, who is the word made flesh, mm -hmm. through scripture. But then after that, we experience Christ in the Eucharist, his body and blood, his passion. Mm -hmm. We unite to that. And we get to partake in that. And that is um, the ultimate. That's the ultimate. Uh, now, that's in the center Right. So the priest okay. is there um, <clears throat> on behalf of us and to, um, I'm trying to keep this simple, to uh, celebrate the mass and the liturgy, but he also needs it too. He's not really there to, uh, you know, tell us how to fix our lives or like he will encourage us. Or if it's a, a gospel passage that maybe is a bit tough, he might, you know, um, give us a challenge or something like that. Yeah. But he's like, hey, I'm a sinner too. I need God's grace. We're all here for the same reason. I just have a different vocation than you. And God's called me to the priesthood. So uh, I'm going to give you a reflection on the gospel, but it's really only about 10 minutes long. There's no hour sermons at mass. Right. Right. The mass is only about an hour long. Right. So it's like liturgy and the songs are all throughout <clears throat> and we stand and then we kneel and then we sit and we, <clears throat> there's all sorts of things. And so um, the center architecturally was Christ and the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. It was, the focus was not the priest. That's why the priest even wears a robe, right? It's like, it's not about me. Like I'm kind of hidden under this, right? And I'm here to serve. Yeah. Um, but what wound up changing in the evangelical world is communion now isn't even every single service, right? Really what you're going there for is the pastors in the middle with a pulpit preaching right. for an hour. Yeah. And so now the, the pastor has actually replaced the, the main reason of what church used right. to be was I'm going to receive the Eucharist and to enter into prayer. And the priest is here to, you know, administer the sacrament and to make the sacrament happen because you need right. a priest in order 
for it to be like, not anybody can just go up to bread and say, you know, consecrate it and have the Holy Spirit come down. Like you have to be a priest in okay. order to do that. A, only a valid priest could do that because God gives him a charism in order to do that. Interesting. Okay. So that's why like you can't just start your own church and be like, okay, here's the body and blood of Christ. I have some grape juice and a cracker. It's like, it doesn't yeah. work that way. Hmm. Um, so uh, yeah. So that's a big difference is at an evangelical church, you sing songs and then you hear a sermon but the main focal point physically is the uh, is the preacher, right? And so you yeah. feel like you were fed by right. someone explaining scripture to you. Yeah. And so uh, a really a famous Catholic who I highly recommend, his name is Scott Hahn. He was a reformed pastor for a long time. He said, Protestants study the menu, but Catholics eat the meal. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense to me too. And so it's great to study the menu and learn about it, but how about yeah. uh, how about we eat too? So like it's a meal, it's a family meal, and I'm also like, oh, Revelation becomes completely different in light of the mass. Mm -hmm. I should give you a book on it if you want. <laughs> I'll like mail it to you, okay? Because I'm not driving to air. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're gonna have to come out maybe sometime and sit down. See, or I maybe actually we'll, we'll meet in the middle. We'll meet yeah. in the middle somewhere. I don't know. Yeah, and uh, I'll give you the book. It's called the. Um, I think it's called the, the, the Supper of the Lamb. Okay. Uh, it's a great book about uh, the liturgy in heaven and the liturgy on earth and how they unite in the mass and how the church fathers understood uh, revelation in light of the liturgy of the mass. Okay. Well, can um, see, I, I, I want to wrap it up, but I want to just before I want to ask one more thing before, before okay. we go, because this, this is kind of the question that I've been, I've been struggling with and trying to work on for the past year. And I feel like I've, I kind of okay. want to spend a good chunk of 21 working on this. And no, by struggling, you did say struggling. Yes. I, I want to struggle with it. I want to struggle with the, the way that, that Jacob struggled with the angel. Ah, okay. 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 <laughs> but no, the, wait a minute. I thought he struggled with God. I thought he was wrestling with God. Well, both, right? It uses, he used both. I mean, depending on the translation you look at, it's, is it the angel Ooh. of the Lord? Is it God? Is it an angel? Right. Well, I think they call it like a theophany. It's like when, yeah. when he told, when God told Moses to hit the rock and he so, did it the second time. I'm wrestling with God on this question about okay. how to, well, I mean, a second ago you said you, you've, you've struggled to remember how to, how to speak uh, Protestant or speak evangelical. Yeah. That's, that's the question I'm trying to figure out is do we need to, are, are we forgetting how to do this or have we never been very good at it? Uh, because I, I notice a lot of tension right now in, in communities that I felt like maybe used to be able to get along a little bit better. Maybe it's mm -hmm. never been the case that we were in that much harmony, but at least now I'm seeing it hit, hit my family where it's like I literally have to heavily, heavily censor myself in order to have a peaceful conversation with oh, wow. certain members of, of family. And it's like I, I, so I wanted to ask about your experience. Like, I mean, your parents are not in the same place as you are. How do you relate to, you know, people who you feel like you should be able to relate to and connect to when your value systems may have changed or like some, some key things are not lined up? Yeah. Are you, do you struggle with that? Do you, is it just kind of well, happening or is it not, not a problem you're worrying about? Well, again, I can't really comment on, I don't know how your parent, I don't know exactly what's going on in your theological journey or your relationship with God and how your parents maybe see certain things, right? Yeah. Um, my mom had concerns at first because it's foreign. It's like, whoa, yeah. Catholicism, like that's sort of the scary other. That's like, yeah. uh, what is that? You know, this big kind of unknown. Um, but she asked questions. And as we talked, she was like, Tyler, I'm not worried at all. She's like, I just see you love Jesus more. She's like, and you're a lot nicer to me. <laughs> like my mom, she's like, Tyler, there's a softness to you now. She's like, you like, are so much kinder to me now that you're Catholic. <laughs> so she's like, I, I love that you're Catholic. She's like, this is great. And you know what really changed was also Mary. When I talked to my mom about Mary, she started to cry. Hmm. Because, yeah, there, it, there, and you know what? I think some guys have an aversion to Catholicism because it seems feminine. Hmm. Like in uh, Protestantism, it's very manly. It's like St. Paul and St. Peter and Calvin and Luther and like, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. reading the Bible and doctrine, right? And it's very intellectual and. When in Catholicism, it's like mystery and Mother Mary and like, mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of like this, like, what is this? Where I will give me the doctrine. And I remember mm -hmm. when I was becoming, uh, when I was becoming Catholic, but I still worked at a, a Protestant church in Hamilton. 
well, like uh, internally, I was sort of opening up to Catholicism and it was having yeah. an influence on me. During one of the meetings, the head pastor there said, I don't know what's going on, but it just, the services feel more feminine. <laughs> he honestly said that. Yeah. And he's like, Tyler, could you sing something more masculine, like a mighty fortress is our God, like something like that. Yeah. Like, I just, yeah. I feel like it's too like soft and lovey dovey. And I was like, oh shoot, does, he's sensing something in me. Cause I was singing like yeah. intimate songs to Christ, like Jesus, I love you. Do you know what I mean? Sure. Sure. But the thing is like, lots of Protestants are fine with that, but Catholics are totally fine with that. It's like my, the goal of my life is to be in love with God. Hmm. God is love and made me for love. And I'm supposed to be in love with him. And his love is supposed to transform me to love other people. And that's what I'm supposed to do. And, and the way I love people is going to look different depending on how old I am and my giftings and my relationship to those people. Yeah. It might be correcting somebody in love, but oftentimes it's not. Right. Yeah. It might just be journaling, journaling, journeying alongside them or giving them an encouraging word or like, I don't know, or maybe it's none of my business and I'm just supposed to take care of my family and do my thing. You know so what you, I mean? You like, actually found it easier to suddenly to relate to your family when, when once you weren't part of the same Christian tradition. <laughs> well, you know, you, to be honest, like I, I'm very blessed because like I, what I will say is. I do. There are times where I'm kind of sad because I can't pray the exact same way. Like there definitely okay. is a difference. And it, that makes you feel sad though. That's interesting. Yeah. Because like I want to share the depth of intimacy, right. With my family, hmm. right. That I can spiritually with other Catholics, right. Like I can't pray the rosary with my mom. Right. Now I'll tell you one thing that was really cool. Uh, I have to be careful how I say this. My mom wanted me to pray for something. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I was like, okay. And, uh, and we were on the phone and then she said, Oh, by the way, Tyler, you can pray like a Catholic. <laughs> and that brought so much joy to my heart because I kind of changed the way I pray. Like I won't make right. the sign of the cross. I'll kind of keep it like, I'm going to stay within the bounds of like prayer as you sure. understand it. Yeah. Because like, why am I going to purposely you don't make pray in a way that I know no... is going to like right. ruffle feathers? Do you yeah. know what I mean? It's like, look, I have more that I can do, but I can also reduce it to perfectly fine right. prayer. Well, I mean, is that sort of the all things to all people that, that Paul's talking about? It's like, okay, maybe there's more here, but the, the idea is for us to unify here. Or we want to be praying together. I'm not trying to just make you, uh, you all confused what? about what I I'm actually, doing. <laughs> I, I, I talked to my mom about this. I said, mom, I love you. And like what I was brought up in was very good. And I see it like a pool, mm -hmm. like a big pool of water. But Catholicism is an ocean. And I said, like, I do long for you to enjoy the ocean with me. Because yeah. now that I know the ocean, I can, like, I can look at the pool and remember that. But like, I'm not going back there. Right. Do you know what I mean? Like, there's more here. The fullness of the truth is here. And so, yeah, in some ways I grieve because I'm going, you seem perfectly fine to stay in the pool but like do you know what i mean like so there is water there and there's yeah. graces there and it, so it's not like oh i know everything now and you know nothing and what i was grew up in was totally an error no 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 it's like okay god's at work in your life and you have a relationship with him and again he's going to call you deeper in his own timing like that's not for me to judge yeah but at the same time like yeah, I I want my my mom and dad to enjoy what I get to enjoy because I feel like they're missing out. Yeah. You know? It's like I don't know if someone's drinking like concentrate orange juice and you have like simply orange or something. Did you, or have, you have your a own time orange grove? Yeah. Did you have a time where you felt kind of obligated to try to get them on board with it? Uh well, I I mean, I think I do have a responsibility in some capacity to when the time is right to, you know, point toward, but just sort of in my everyday life, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I guess what I would say, like Catholics, well, and a lot of Protestants know that it's God that changes the heart. I don't do that. Yeah. Right. Like that's not my role. I don't know the future. I don't know the heart of that person. Um, so I pray for wisdom and discernment and I like, God, please help me to, to, you know, if something needs to be said to say it at the right time. But most of the time I'm just trying to like, like I've had conversations, lots of conversations with my mom, but they're not these like, 
um, heated things or like, do you know what I mean? Like this condescending kind of thing. Right. It's like a loving right. conversation. And sometimes my mom will, like I might open up about something and then my mom will be like, oh, I remember there's lots of things that, oh yeah, so sorry. So this was really interesting. Um, my mom said, you can pray like a Catholic. Yeah. And I said, okay. <laughs> and then she said, I'm not like, I'm not there yet. She's like, I'm not going to ask saints to pray for me, but can you ask them to pray okay. for me? Wow. So what was funny is That's my so... mom's actually even more Catholic because she's going through another interme intermediary <laughs> to go to an intermediary. Yeah. I'm like, you're, so you're asking me to ask them to ask God? Sure. Okay. I'll do that. <laughs> but, so but that's the thing is because she knows that, but right. I think my mom and my mom has also like opened up a little bit. Cause she's the thing that there's no denying for her. Cause she's much more like experiential. My mom is not so much doctrine. Yeah. Like there is doctrine there, but my mom's very sensitive to like, Hey, I see God at work in this person's life. Yeah. She's like, there's no denying that I see fruit. So she's going in no, even though I don't know how that works, like God is obviously at work. So when she saw a change in my life and that I was becoming better in all sorts of ways and I loved God more and I was treating her with more kindness, she was like, obviously God is a part of this. So who yeah. am I to get in the way? Yeah. And when I talked to my mom, I said, mom, I'm Catholic and I would like you to be too. You know, I was like, is, I said, for me, I wasn't Catholic because I had intellectual obstacles. Once those were removed, I felt almost like I must become Catholic because in good conscience, I can't, I would be now rejecting yeah. what I know to be true. Right. But for my mom, she's not there. I said, are you not Catholic because you don't see a need? You're like, Hey, if that, if that works for you, Tyler, great. Like you almost see it. Like there's different flavors of Christianity and you just pick the one you feel that God has called you to. She's like, yeah, that's basically where I'm at. Yeah. And I was like, okay, well, all right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then yeah, I yeah. said to my mom, um, I think we we're talking about the Eucharist. And my mom really heard me and I could tell like the wheels were turning and she's taking it in. But then she said, she's like, I'm not there yet. She's like, I got to think about that one, but I, I'm not there yet. And I said, okay. And that's the thing. Like God only judges you with what you know and the graces he's given you. Sure. Right. So like, like a five-year-old is going to be judged differently than an 80 year old. And a priest is going to be judged differently than someone who lives in a jungle and has never heard the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. The context of your life is yeah the, the light that you've received or the gifts you've been given like and it even says like i think it's in james where it says teachers are judged even more strictly because they should know better right than like the person that isn't as learned and it's like so god takes into account your total life and he knows what graces he gives you and let's say that you were presented the gospel but the person was a jerk about it and you rejected yeah. that yeah you're not held morally culpable for that because anybody would reject that because it wasn't said in love Sure. Right. So it's, a, and God wasn't even at work in there tugging on your heartstrings. There was no knocking on the door there. Right. Yeah. That was just someone thinking that they're going to tell you something and that the Holy Spirit wasn't at all involved in that. Yeah. So you're somebody trying to rack up, rack up converts. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And, and that's like conversion is great, yeah. but then you have to live it out. Right. You know, like endure your baptism. Yeah. Uh, run the race to the end. I mean, yeah. Jesus himself says those who endure to the end will be saved. He didn't yeah. say those who were, you know, started. Who, those who said the prayer. Well, that, that's the thing. There's yeah. no ask Jesus into your heart anywhere in the Bible. Yeah. That's not even in scripture. So if you wanted a verse, yeah. like, where's that? Oh, man. Uh, no, well, oh, my goodness. There's so much. <laughs> Actually, can I <laughs> well, ask you a question? Yeah. What's your, what's your view of sola scriptura? Because that was a big one for me. Uh, I feel like... There's different people who are pulling different things out of that phrase. Uh, like, I mean, w when I think about sola scriptura, the meaning of those words, scripture alone, I think, well, that sounds wrong. <laughs> like, Christianity is so much bigger than just scripture, and relationship with God is so much bigger than that, too. It's like, this is not the only important thing, and, and if I... 
if I only had access to scripture, I didn't have a community to help me interpret and live it out. And I didn't have a tradition connected to it. And I didn't have art and I didn't have a relationship with God myself. Well, scripture would be pretty useless to me, actually. Well, I, I don't think that's what they mean by it. Right? I, like, I, know. And I don't mean it that way either. But I mean, like as the sole authority, that's infallible. I, I mean, then, then you have to start asking questions about what, what infallibility means. <laughs> well, and here's the thing. Catholics say that scripture is inerrant, but they don't say that it's infallible. Okay. Because for something to be infallible, it has to be an agent. Okay. Okay. Like it can't fail in what it wants to do. Like since scripture is a document, right? right that's written down. It's not a living yeah. person. It's inerrant which means that there is no error when interpreted correctly, right? That God said what he wanted to say. Now, you also have to take into account the culture of the time, the, sure. right, is it poetry? Is it history? Is it apocalyptic literature? So yeah. on and so yeah. forth. But that, like, um, it is inerrant that it is God's word. Yeah. But it's not infallible. To be infallible, you have to be a living agent like a pope, right? So infallible like meaning not able to fail? Pardon? Infallible meaning not not able to fail, like you're not going to fail. Is that what fallible is meaning? Like what uh, what is fallibility uh, well, having to do? In regards to Christian morals and faith. Well, what does it have if, to do with being an agent? Is what I'm asking because you said that's the difference. Oh well, because infallible would mean that like it it is like functioning. Like what I mean is when we go to scripture, right? We're interpreting it, mm -hmm. right? And uh, so Catholics believe that it's inerrant. That means that there isn't error written down. Mm -hmm. But infallible is something that's acting right now, right? That's able to, like, you can walk around and eat and breathe and and you're fallible and I'm fallible. Like, we we make mistakes, right? We're okay. able to do things that are, that, that would be wrong or say things that would be incorrect, right? When the Bible is sitting there on a table it's already written down. There's nothing. Yeah. It's not like it's going to say something else or that there's going to be new things spoken. Right. Yeah. It's, it's written down. So that document is there. And, and, and so we can go to it and it can be new to us. Like, I'm not right. saying that it doesn't have like that. The Holy spirit doesn't work through it or that it isn't the word of God. I'm not saying that. Yeah. But uh, infallible is saved for something like the church that is um, like a living organism made up of people, made, yeah. made up of believers, and the Pope. Now, this doesn't mean that the Pope is infallible in everything that he does. Yeah, It's just if he speaks called ex cathedra or ex cathedra, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Yeah. It's when he addresses the whole church on an issue of faith and morals, and it's meant to be binding on all Christians for all time. If he speaks that way, then, that, then the church says the Holy Spirit ensures that, it's, that that is infallible. Okay. I, I want to ask more questions about that because that sounds like an interesting topic too. But I I'm getting tired. I want to I want to go get ready for. I got okay. some other. I I got actually book club going on this evening, which is which has oh, wow. been a really great thing to that we started doing I'm so this sorry, year. Guys, if this went on too long. I oh see no, not at all, man. Stretching over there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I don't mean I'm tired of talking to you. I just literally did not sleep enough over the holidays, oh, and okay. uh, I feel like I, I want to give you my my full attention when we start talking okay. again. I think I'm pretty pumped because I don't have to look after my five children right now. Oh, nice. And I get to talk about stuff that most people never want to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love talking about this stuff. So uh, See, that's great. You're one in a million, man. Because most people could, could so care less. Th may that might just mean that this is going to be a very unpopular <laughs> podcast, but we'll see. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, around the world, people care about this. <laughs> we'll, ho we'll I mean hope some people will care. Well, that was interesting. If you enjoyed this conversation, feel free to subscribe, like the video. Any kind of engagement really helps out with algorithm stuff as far as I'm aware. Another thing I'd love if you would do would be to share this video with someone who you think might find it interesting or specifically might disagree with it about something or disagree with you about something and use it as a launch pad to have an interesting conversation, have an interesting disagreement maybe, because that's really what this whole thing is about for me. I think that having, you know, honest disagreements is a really useful and meaningful thing to do. Anyways, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.